So I now reconvene the general session. Will the recording secretary please call the roll? Catherine Williams Brown. Here. Jose Cardenas. Juan Cruz. Christopher Davis. Here. Michael De La Torre. Present. Marisol De La Torre Escobedo. Anna Marie Francois. Makita Gwino Shire. Present. Megan Gross. Present. Johanna Howick. Present. Susan Aradia. Present. Perry Jackson. Here. Bonnie Kla. Present. Monica Martinez. Here. David Simmons. Here. Tina Sloan. Here. Kimberly Y. Smith. Danette Brown. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. I'd like to remind the members of the public about the process to provide public comment. The committee chair will announce when the public comment period is open during the presentation of the agenda item and ask for anyone who wishes to comment to notify the meeting moderator. Individuals who attend the meeting at the commission office here will need to submit a request to address the commission card to the meeting operator. The meeting moderator will notify the individual when it's their turn to speak. At that time, the individual will be able to approach the microphone and share their comment. Individuals who join the meeting via the Zoom webcast will need to click on the raise hand icon to inform the meeting moderator that they'd like to speak on the item. The meeting moderator will notify the individual when it's their turn to speak by calling their Zoom ID. Please remember that the Zoom ID is the name used when logging into the meeting. At that time, the individual will be prompted to unmute their microphone and will be able to share their comment. Please note the Zoom ID name used by the member of the public to join the Zoom meeting will be displayed to the public when individual provides public comment. Individuals who join the meeting via the U.S. toll-free number will need to press star 9 on their phone to inform the meeting moderator that they'd like to speak on the item. The moderator will notify the individual it's their turn to speak by calling their phone number and will allow them to unmute their telephone. At that time, the individual will be prompted to press star six and will be able to share their comment. Please note only a partial phone number will be displayed to the public when the individual provides public comment. All right, now say meeting moderator 10 times fast. Um, all right, everyone, we do have, um, uh, a very packed agenda over the next two days. Yesterday was a very long day. We also had to move one item that we did not get to. So today and tomorrow, we're going to be very diligent on time limits. We're going to be as efficient as we can so that we can make sure to get everything out on the table and that we can have time to deliberate as needed. So I will now recess the general session and move to the certification committee. Commissioner Simmons, will you please uh, convene the committee? I now convene the certification committee. The committee has one item before it today. Item 4A, which is report to the legislature on credentialing related to non-core teaching assignments pursuant to Assembly Bill 1505. This action is uh, this is an action item that will be presented by Aaron Scoobel and Aaron Henderson. Ms. Scoobel, please begin. Good morning. It's really great to be here with you all today. This is the first time I've been able to present in front of you live uh, since we've come back. So um, thank you all for entertaining us with our um, AB 1505 report. <clears throat> um, this agenda item is in response to Education Code 47605.4B, which requires the commission to report to the legislature by June 30th of 2022 to examine whether existing certificates, permits, or other documents adequately address the needs for non-core, non-college preparatory courses in all schools. This is an action item, and approval of the report will result in transmittal of the report to the legislature. With me today is Erin Henderson via Zoom. She is the Assignments Monitoring Program Manager, and she's going to be going through the bulk of the report with us today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Erin. And our screens went blank, so hopefully she's out there. I'm here. Um, can you see my screen? I'm trying to share. We'll give it just one second to see if the technology can catch up to us, but we can hear you, Erin. Okay, good. I'm going to stop sharing my screen if you can't see it, and then I'm going to reshare to, to see if that works. So one more time. Did that happen to work? 
Can can you guys hear me, or or see my screen? We cannot see your screen yet, you, but we can't see your shared screen. Oh, you might you might have to go off camera if you're using two monitors. Okay, let me do that. Did that work? Erin, why don't you go ahead and hop in on starting with the background and we'll see if the geniuses in the room can solve the technology issue for us. Sure thing, will do. Mike, thank you very much. Uh, the request for this report coincided with the passage of Assembly Bills 1219 and 1505 in 2019. And these bills align with certification and monitoring requirements between charter and non-charter schools. Specifically, 1505 removed charter schools' abilities to assign uncredentialed educators in non-core courses and granted temporary flexibility to those educators already employed in these positions. So this report was necessitated by these changes and intended as a way to understand the effect that they had on both charter and non-charter schools. So note that core curriculum is defined in Education Code 60605 as including reading, writing, mathematics, social science, and science. Uh, we applied these to the single subject areas that the commission issues and considered subjects that are excluded from those core categories to be non-core. Um, if you could see my screen, you would see those categories right here, but you can also find a list um, on the definition section in the item on page 13. Um, I'm going to go into research as well. Uh, to examine non-core assignments, we analyzed assignment monitoring data from 2021, uh, the 2021 school year. And we were limited to one year of available assignment data pursuant to Education Code 44258.9, which provides that the previous year's monitoring data is non-consequential and therefore not to be made publicly available. So COVID-19 also created some concerns during this particular year as it caused school closures, a reliance on distance learning, and significant impacts to already present teacher shortages. So these effects could lead to anomalies uh, that make these data unreliable for inference. We also released a survey to all individuals involved in monitoring. So respondents included individuals from county offices of education, districts, traditional and charter schools. And it received about 159 responses, uh, the majority of which represented traditional educational segments, but charter schools represented about 27% of all respondents. And we were also able to configure the survey so that only those respondents who monitored or assigned educators in charter schools were able to respond to questions concerning charter assignments. So this is the part where I would move into showing you uh, the data. So do we want to try again? Or Erin, do you have a? I'm going to see if I can connect my computer for you all. Erin, uh, you see, are the, are the data tables that she's going to show? They are, and I can go ahead and uh, reference them as you go through, Erin. Yeah. We'll just do that. Yeah, that would be fine. So the first one I'm referencing is a comparison of core and non-core courses. Um, I think that's probably figures. the first figure. Yeah, figures one and two on page four of your report. Great, thank you. So within the monitoring data, we first compared non-core and core assignments to see if there was a greater number of misassignments in either area. So core courses were more likely to be misassigned across the board. Uh, we also did analysis to see if that was true across the different sectors. So as you can see, uh, both traditional and and charter schools have more challenges assigning appropriately credentialed educators in core classrooms, but charter schools see less of a difference between the two classroom types. Okay, and now I'm going to move on to share of misassignments per sector. So um, I'm not sure what the figure is, Erin, if you could call that out. Absolutely, this is figure so, five, and you can find figure okay. five on page seven. Thank you. So as well, almost exactly one third of all non-core misassignments occur in charter schools, though they do represent only one tenth of the educational landscape. So the large number of non-core misassignments in charter schools is unsurprising as they are you know, adjusting to the additional certification requirements imposed by AB 1505. 
As mentioned, uh, they are granted temporary assignment flexibility in non-core assignments. However, educators granted flexibility are also included in this chart as they are still considered misassigned. Education Code 44258.10 makes that very clear, but also specifies that those educators do not legally need to be removed from their positions on the basis of these misassignments until 2025. Okay, and now I'm going to move on to the most misassigned uh, non-core subjects. So, um, I'm not sure of the figure there either, Erin, do you wanna? Absolutely, this is figure four, and it's on page six. Thanks. So these are the most misassigned non-core subjects across sectors. In both charter and traditional schools, elective are the most misassigned, uh, electives are the most misassigned classes followed by physical education. However, traditional schools have a higher concentration of misassignments in these areas, so 65% in total, whereas these subjects encompass only about half in charter uh, school non-core misassignments. So this leads to more dispersion of misassignments across the various other non-core content areas in charter schools. And um, as you can see, there's a figure uh, in there in the item of the complete breakdown. I think it's figure five uh, for each sector. So we should talk about elective courses. So they comprise in total a third of all norm core misassignments. And they are defined as those that fall outside of the statutory subject areas. So homeroom, um, AVID, student government, and study hall courses are some typical examples of electives. So Title V 80005B provides that any teacher who has earned a credential based on a bachelor's degree and student teaching can teach elective courses. So that is very broad. However, uh, the definition excludes emergency permit, intern, and waiver document holders from staffing courses. Uh, further analysis of elective misassignments demonstrated uh, that 44.5% of these assignments result from an educator holding one of those documents. And then um, finally, I'm just gonna touch on survey results. Uh, survey respondents, uh, were asked about assignment conditions in non-core classrooms. Uh, regarding charter schools, the majority agreed that uh, they felt that these schools will experience staffing shortages once the classroom um, flexibility expires in 2025. But in general, respondents said that they were most likely to recruit less than fully prepared educators when experiencing staffing shortages. And you can see the prevalence of that in uh, figure seven, uh, other options that they use in figure seven. As well, uh, more respondents disagree and agree that existing credential pathways uh, do not meet assignment needs. And to that end as well, 61% of respondents indicated that staffing issues in non-core classrooms can lead to being unable to offer courses in this content. Thank you, Erin. So I'm gonna take it from here. Um, we just want to stress that due to the lack of longitudinal data and, you know, the impacts of COVID-19 um, on available data, further analysis of assignment trends after the completion of um, several more years of assignment monitoring um, would be ideal in order for us to better understand uh, the needs presented in non-core teaching assignments. Because of this, the report does not intentionally provide any policy recommendations to the legislature. Some educational partners that shared their feedback after the draft report was published indicated that the final paragraph in the report may be taken as a recommendation from the commission related to charter school flexibility under AB 1505. As the requirement for the commission to create this report under AB 1505 encompassed credentialing options for non-core, non-college preparatory teaching assignments only, and the intention was not to address flexibilities that were only related to charter schools, Staff recommends that the commission move to approve the report with the amendment to strike the last paragraph of the report and transmit the amended report to the legislature. So with that, I will conclude our presentation and we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for that. And it's, uh, I apologize you weren't able to show your PowerPoint, I, but I, I know you worked very hard on it, but I, we will see if we can provide some other option for that to be seen. Now, we will open for public comment. If there are members of the public that would like to give a presentation, please notify the meeting moderator by submitting a request card or clicking on the raised hand icon if participating through Zoom or pressing asterisk 9 if participating by phone. 
Uh, because of the large workload that we're experiencing today, we will limit all public comment to one minute. A clock will be displayed and it will give you like a 15 second warning. Recording secretary, are there any public comments? No public comments on this item. The public comment uh, period for this item is now closed. Do commissioners have any questions or comments on this item? Commissioner Clatt. Thank you. Um, thank you, I really appreciated the report. It's such a complicated um, thing and um, the report, very, I think, did a really nice job in, in trying to parse out and really clearly communicate what's going on. I just have a question, a clarification question about which paragraph. So is it the paragraph on page, the bottom of page 12 that's being deleted? Uh, I believe that is correct. Let me I just want to make confirm. sure I'm looking at it right. Yes, it is the last, for the, the last paragraph on page 12, correct. Okay. And I was just curious, and I don't know if you can answer this or not, was it the last sentence of the last paragraph that people um, were more worried about, or was I, it the whole paragraph? I do think the last sentence was the greatest concern, um, definitely, but um, I think the entire paragraph kind of relates to that um, idea of the flexibility around AB 1505. So. Um, the consensus uh, from the educational partners that commented were, was that the last paragraph should be removed. So the entire paragraph. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Sure. I just wanted to make sure I was looking at the right one. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, join in the thank you for the comprehensive report. And as data geeks, geeks you know, we're all gonna be into this at some time. So my one data question is, can, can you do Miss assignments by um, school size in the future, charter and non-charter? Um, I think we could absolutely look at the different um, district designations. Um, I don't know that we could necessarily go down to the school site level and look at that, but we could look at small, medium, and large okay. um, districts as they're defined in ed code, absolutely. And then just a follow-up question, can you do it by uh, grade level, elementary, middle, high school? Yes, we, yeah. we do have that data. We, okay. and, well, and I guess we it's are, mostly high school we're looking at with Mrs. Assignments. Yeah. Uh, primarily for these non-core assignments, some in the middle school, um, okay. but they are primarily high school assignments. Um, so, so just to kind of give you a preview, Erin is also working on um, our entire breakdown of the assignment monitoring data from this school year. So that should be coming to you in a future item as well. Thank you so much. I mean, this just has so much to do with the teacher quality and, and it's a really, nice um, addition that we were able to do in our data dashboard. So thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Redia. Okay, thank you. I, just, I have a quick question. So um, I don't have the definitions of small, medium, and large in front of me, um, according to CTCs or, or your, are the definitions you use. But does the small also include, that is the rural communities, or do you, um, you know, aggregate out for this, for the um, rural communities? Um, likely the rural communities would be included in the definition of a small school district. They are defined in statute for CDE's purposes. So um, what we could do is, is you know, look into that specific definition and um, separate out the, the monitoring results for the different size school districts. Mm -hmm. Now this is an action item. Do I hear a motion to approve Assembly Bill the Assembly Bill 1505 report for transmittal to the legislature with the amendments provided by staff? I so move, Commissioner Simons. I have a motion by Commissioner Martinez. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by Commissioner Davis. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Skubel and Ms. Henderson. Having no additional items today, I adjourn the certification committee. Well done, thank you all. Next is the Educator Preparation Committee. Commissioner Martinez, will you please reconvene the committee?
I was nameless all day yesterday, but I'm back. And we're going to um, stick with our first item, 3D, um, and uh, Executive Director Sandy will introduce it. And then we'll go back to the item we didn't do yesterday, which was 3B. Um, so, um, Executive Director Sandy, can I um, lean on you to kick us off for this study group? Yes, ma'am, you may. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are still awaiting two of our speakers uh, to join the Zoom, and uh, Ron and Hyde, you just give me the signal when they're available. Uh, but we are happy to um, have an opportunity to take a deep dive into performance assessment, uh, which has been a core part of the Commission's theory of action around credential and, and licensure since the mid-1990s. <laughs> Um, and so what I'm going to do is provide just a little bit of background that about, you know, what, what were the conditions that led to our movement into um, performance assessment as a strategy. Uh, and then we, we have today two great panels to uh, shed, shed light on all of this. The first panel will involve Linda Darling Hammond um, from Stanford University, president of the State Board of Education, who has done a lot of work and research on performance assessments over many decades now. And also Charles Peck, or Cap Peck, who has been, uh, also has done a great deal of research and in fact has a, a recent publication with the National Academy of Education where he reviewed the research literature on the EdTPA uh, and policies across the country. Uh, and, and these, that, um, you have citations in the uh, agenda item for you that, uh, for, for a number of, of research articles that uh, dig into what are TPAs and how are they used, et cetera. Um, our second panel will involve a group of program directors, a dean, uh, and a couple of practitioners uh, or uh, who are, I, I'm not sure if they're still in the candidate status. They are practitioners now, but who've come through preparation programs and did participate in TPA or APA. That's the uh, TPA is teaching performance assessment. APA is administrator performance assessment. So we'll get to hear from, from a couple of those folks as well. So our goal in this first segment of the day <laughs> Commissioner, since so many of you are new to this table and weren't here while the, the whole kind of approach and policy uh, was laid down and developed and has been under implementation, felt it was a critical time to bring all of you up to speed on what it is, why we do it, um, and what, you know, both the challenges and the opportunities are within the teaching performance assessment work. Um, so that's what we're going to do, and I still don't have a signal that our speakers are here, so I might keep going. Okay, very good. And, um, okay. and let me just do one more thing. I didn't officially yeah. convene, reconvene okay. the Educator Prep Committee. So this is my official. I'm reconvening the Educator Prep Committee. Okay. And um, Rhonda and Haiju, I see that one of our speakers is on, but she's listed as an observer. So if you can make her a presenter. Uh, so while we are still getting that sorted out, um, in the mid-1990s, we were instructed by the legislature to conduct a, a, a significant review of all of the requirements for earning and renewing a teaching credential in California. This was the Senate Bill 1422 work. I think that bill was signed into law in 1992, and we uh, convened a group and had a report out in 1995. Uh, which was followed by a bill, the Senate Bill 2042, uh, which led to a whole revision to our standards and the implementation or the, the proposed implementation of a performance assessment when we could uh, put one together and provide sufficient resources to actually get it up and running for the state. So the conditions at the time, the 1990s were a period where we moved from, well, we moved into, I can't say what we moved from, <laughs> a different historian at the table maybe can, but we moved into, we were starting to move into standards in a very significant way, standards and assessment uh, in our K-12 schools uh, and so a very rigid and rigorous approach to how we should be teaching in the schools. And of course, whenever we're making changes of this size and magnitude in the schools, there's always the question of where are we with the preparation of the teaching force? And are these things aligned? 
are teachers prepared to do what the state standards and expectations are for schools? So that's part of how the commission works. We work in conjunction with the other state agencies that set standards for the schools. So at the time there was concern about the, and, uh, and not a lot of confidence in, um, in teacher preparation and whether we were getting consistently well-prepared teachers through that system and a belief that there was great unevenness in the preparation of teachers across the 80 institutions and you know several hundred different program strands leading to a teaching credential and the commission at the time grappled with that in the 1990s is there anybody in the room by the way maybe david simmons who was around for 1422 2042 oh you're making me feel old tina sloan was here thank you <laughs> it was some very very deep and rich work where every stone really got turned over and looked at, and some it was one of the one of the 25 year reforms that you do uh, to look at a system and, and put new theories of action in play. So the performance assessment emerged in the context of how can we bring some stability to a sector that is perceived to be very uneven in the way it prepares and develops teachers for licensure. Um, and I'm hoping now that that is enough context. Maybe I've done enough to pique your curiosity that we're ready to turn it over to our first speaker. And I just saw a glimpse of her on screen. So I am I'm at that point. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Linda Darling Hammond, who is prepared to talk us through some of the history on all of this. And thank you so much, Linda, for being with us. Of course, I'm talking to myself on mute. <laughs> Is that better? Uh, it's great to see everyone, friends old and new. Uh, and uh, I've been asked to give sort of a historical perspective on performance assessments. I'll just say that I have been an advocate for performance assessments for students as well as for teachers for a long time. I was a high school English teacher and um, was involved with folks who were developing writing portfolios and a variety of other things way back in the day. Um, when we think about uh, performance assessments for teaching, just to put this in the context of um, assessment in most professions, uh, most professions develop their own assessments and they're delivered as a condition for a license. So you can think of the uh, tasks of the, of the profession that are embodied in the bar exam for lawyers, medical licensing exams for doctors, nursing exams, the architecture portfolio that architects um, use as a basis for registration uh, and accounting uh, exams and so on. And in those cases, the tasks of the profession are represented um, in um, a more or less authentic way on the exams. That was not the way the teacher testing unfolded. As Mary was describing, it was born of distrust of the profession and of um, schools of education and uh, initially created by testing companies. So in the 1970s, we had minimum competency tests and that movement uh, to, you know, led to our CBEST in California, looking at basic skills, mostly through multiple choice uh, items. In the 1980s, the subject matter tests that resulted in our CSET in uh, California, uh, but many other versions across the country also substantially multiple choice um, tests. Uh, then there were a set of pedagogy tests, um, typically also multiple choice. Um, our RECA is an example of one of those. Uh, and that happened in the 1970s and 1980s, and it was not until the 1990s that performance assessments were beginning to be developed. And they were developed initially by teachers, for teachers, uh, at the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, which was created in 1987. There's a board predominantly of teachers and um, really uh, the first time that teachers set their own standards uh, and developed their own assessments. And there, I was actually part of that process. And it was a big arm wrestle to figure out what kind of assessments were going to be used. The first idea was you know, to bring back another round of multiple choice tests of teaching. And that was rejected by the um, commissioners by the by the members of that board. Uh, the um, then there were a lot of other strategies. So they insisted on some kind of a performance assessment that we really had to look at what teachers know and can do. Uh, everyone who knows about the board knows about the five propositions, uh, and it was a different conception of teaching because at that time a lot of the evaluation tools were checklists 
of did the teacher do this, did the teacher do that? But they weren't in a context of does the teacher do things that make sense for the content that they're teaching and the students in their class, such that they can bring the child to the curriculum and the curriculum to the child and result in more effective learning. And that's what the board wanted to be sure would be represented. And um, there were a variety of, um, of um, models developed and brought to the board. Uh, and I was uh, remember one very fraught meeting where one of those checklist approaches had to be rejected, even though it would set back the timeline for the board. Uh, and ultimately, a portfolio approach was accepted. Um, the board had to demonstrate that it could be uh, administered, you know, and scored in a reliable way, and um, that, uh, in fact, uh, it would capture some of the key elements of teaching. And uh, the the board's work, uh, as you know, has continued for, for many, many years. There was a um, initially support for the uh, process of board certification from the Clinton administration, but when the administrations changed, there was uh, you know, a, a lot of pushback against this idea of a professional assessment. Uh, and um, so the board was challenged to undertake a set of studies to demonstrate that it made a difference. And in fact, over the course then of a couple of decades, many studies have been done showing that teachers who achieve board certification are more effective in supporting student learning, uh, not only as individual teachers, but having board certified teachers in a school uh, enhances the work of the entire school and that of the peers and colleagues and that board certified teachers as mentor teachers um, uh, enable their beginning teachers to become more effective uh, as well. Uh, and so the, the challenge was met in that regard and it was the board's model for performance assessment in which teachers consider their um, their context, they write commentaries about how their decisions about teaching are responsive to the content they're teaching to the students, often to specific students, and look at student learning as a part of the process rather than the old scripted view that the teacher just barrels ahead and does, you know, does whatever is in the curriculum and ignores the students. Um, that that view is what was taken up uh, when 2042 that Mary referenced came to California. In 1998, it required a teacher performance assessment for graduation and entry into the profession. Uh, that's how um, the PACT was born. Some of you may remember the performance assessment for California teachers and the initial Cal TPA. The Cal TPA was developed by the commission uh, with teacher input uh, and with ETS. The PACT was developed by a set of universities. I was at that time at Stanford as a teacher educator. Uh, and sitting around a table with colleagues from CSU and from UC. And we just knew that the requirement had been uh, launched and that we were that something was going to have to happen. And we said, well, we don't know what the state is going to do, but whatever it is, we may or may not like it. So why don't we do our own thing? And uh, the PACT, there was, and a lot of those folks had been involved with the National Boards Assessment. So the PACT was modeled on the National Board Assessment, uh, the idea of understanding how uh, candidates approach planning, implementation of that and instruction with videotaped uh, evidence, uh, assessment of student learning and reflection on the next things to do to support those students uh, was, was became the model framework for that assessment. So it was designed by teachers and teacher educators together. Uh, and for a, a number of years, um, it, it was um, implemented uh, only within, um, with, within program scoring. Uh, and there were uh, models created based on the National Board for scoring reliably and validly and all of that and doing audits and so on. Uh, but it was really very much a, a local enterprise. And I will say that that experience uh, was transformative for programs uh, and for candidates. <clears throat> it uh, required, um, of course, a lot of supports. Uh, but what we found was that it helped us focus our courses and our clinical work on what teachers needed to be able to do at the end of the day. So it, you know, it required us to connect theory to practice in much more um, purposeful ways. Uh, it, uh, it brought faculty and supervisors 
uh, together along with cooperating teachers uh, who were all involved in the scoring. We even had some of the principals from professional development schools uh, involved in scoring, I know, in our own program uh, and planning the curriculum. And it created a cycle of, um, of planning. Uh, and I know Kat Peck is going to say more about that. It pointed to program needs uh, and gave real feedback to professors. And, you know, I think anyone who's been in teacher education knows that it's been challenging since teacher education moved into universities when normal schools were, you know, done away with in the 1950s, it's been challenging to help professors cohere around uh, a curriculum that is coherent across courses because every professor, you know, kind of wants to do their own thing. Uh, and that also connects to clinical practice uh, and connects to what teachers really need to know and be able to do because teaching is a proactive uh, activity. You can't just learn it from reading books and, you know, contemplating theories. And so uh, it really did uh, push us to make those connections between theory and practice uh, to connect the people and the, the processes. Then we got a lot of um, the kind of uh, feedback from folks who were involved in this. I'll just give you a couple of um, examples of, of what we heard from folks in the field. Um, one of the teacher ed faculty members said, this scoring experience forced me to revisit the question of what really matters in the assessment of teachers, which means revisiting the question of really matters in the preparation of teachers. Um, a cooperating teacher said, the scoring process forces you to be clear about good teaching, what it looks like, sounds like, enables you to look at your own practice critically with new eyes. Uh, an induction program coordinator said, I have a much clearer picture of what credential holders will bring to us and what will they'll be required to do. We can build on this. One of the candidates said, the most valuable thing for me was the sequencing of the lessons, teaching the lesson, evaluating what the kids are getting, what the kids aren't getting, having that be reflected in my next lesson, the teach assess, teach assess, teach assess process. And so you're constantly changing. You may have a plan, uh, but knowing that it's flexible, it has to be flexible based on what the children learn each day. So focusing uh, teacher education on student learning was, was the big takeaway from this. And then across the programs, that were involved in PACT. We had annual conferences, which CTC continues to this day for performance assessment, uh, and pointed to some of the areas where we, as, as, as a whole, as a whole enterprise of teacher education, we needed to uh, improve around English, uh, teaching English learners, around uh, helping our candidates be prepared to engage in assessments. And then we uh, shared practices across uh, universities, uh, how are you tackling this? How are you tackling this uh, to raise the bar generally? And that is the point of performance assessment is that it's an educative process. It's educative for the candidates because they are enabled to pull things together. It's educative when it works well for the faculty and for the programs. Uh, we, um, I just recently taught in STEP uh, again um, year, a year ago. Uh, and we, the, the Stanford now has used the TPA, which evolved out of the pact. Uh, and I still got those positive comments from candidates because in the course that I taught on uh, special education, we embedded a task of the ed TPA into the course, helped the candidates learn to look at their learners and figure out how to support their learning. So they were really prepared to carry that right into the assessment. Um, so the EdTPA grew out of that because uh, a number of folks uh, across the country started using the PACT because they really thought it was a useful thing to do. Vanderbilt University and some folks in New York, some people in Ohio. Cap will tell you that he was here in California and went to the University of Washington and wanted to continue to do it. So the EdTPA was built uh, by uh, really hundreds and ultimately with all the revisions, thousands of teachers and teacher educators across the country on the same model uh, with some revisions. And the development of performance assessments has been an evolution. We now have the a new Cal TPA, uh, which has been developed by California teacher educators uh, and teachers, which I think improves on the ed TPA in a number of important ways as people have learned how to think more deeply about culturally responsive practice, about how to demonstrate some of the equity uh, values that are um, embedded in the assessments. Um, but implementation needs have also emerged 
And among the things that uh, folks have learned as we've looked at these assessments, we will I, I will back up and say that like the National Board Assessment, um, both the PACT and the NTPA were found to be um, predictive of, of teachers' effectiveness, particularly in English language arts, particularly for the teaching of reading and for student learning gains in reading. Um, but there are a lot of implementation complexities and challenges that uh, uh, are also um, emerging and, and getting dealt with in various ways. So one is that you know, the strength and the duration of clinical practice makes a big difference. The initial programs that uh, designed the PACT, for example, were all offering a full year of student teaching from the moment that the school year begins, you know, through the uh, entire rest of the year, often with the uh, sort of a residency approach to that where the candidates uh, were you know, getting a lot of experience uh, in the classroom uh, before and while they were uh, doing the assessments. Uh, support for mentors and professors uh, makes a big difference, we find. Um, whether it's well integrated in the programs, uh, whether it's integrated into the courses, whether it's integrated into the clinical practice, whether the supervisors and the cooperating teachers know a great deal about it. Um, there's less understanding of the assessment by those who are not involved in scan scoring or examining the work of candidates. Uh, Ca California does have a requirement because that scoring is so valuable that any assessment in California has to provide the option for local scoring. Of course, at Fresno with the FAST, which is another a performance assessment model that we have, uh, that, that is the practice because they designed and operate and met the standards for the assessments themselves. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it is work to do that. And um, quite often uh, that has been outsourced. And when people don't engage with the assessment as much that it's um, harder for them to understand what the requirements will be. Um, and then the challenges of the pandemic cannot be underestimated, uh, the supports into teaching, uh, and the fact that so many candidates, because of shortages, uh, have been coming in in recent uh, years through various kinds of routes that don't have uh, traditional student teaching um, and may or may not be providing all of the supports that are that are needed. So all of those have become part of the, the implementation um, question that is on the table, uh, along with the evolution of the designs themselves. I'll just mention one other thing, which is the administrative performance assessment in California, uh, because we have been engaging in performance assessment work for quite some time. Uh, that happened because when we were uh, in the, I was chairing the commission at this time, uh, we discovered that uh, principals, many principals were coming into the profession based on older rules without any training for administration and by taking a multiple choice test. And that was becoming a, a pretty common option for a lot of folks. And we looked at the test. We sat around the table uh, with, um, you know, having signed those non-disclosure agreements and looked at the test. And the commissioners said, you know, this does not tell me that you know how to be an administrator. In fact, one uh, person uh, said, who'd been in the legislature previously said, I could pass this test and I can tell you I would be a terrible principal. So that was one of the um, instigators to say, if we're going to have an assessment for administrators, it should be a performance assessment. It should tell us something about whether a person knows how to assess teaching and support teaching, whether they know how to uh, design school improvement activities and so on. And so the APA was designed with uh, uh, leaders in California's administrator preparation programs uh, and uh, colleague administrators uh, and is now off to its beginning start. Uh, and I've been hearing very strong support for that. But AXA came to the table, the Association of uh, School Administrators in California and said, we really want this assessment. And we want it to apply to not only people coming in through an alternate route, but to all of the principals who are coming into the schools, uh, because we think it will help improve the quality of the preparation that they have. So it's been an evolving process for performance assessment, and there are other states where other assessments are evolving as well uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, and um, the uh, potential value of these uh, assessments 
is really going to um, continue to depend on the evolution of the assessments themselves and the supports uh, and, and um, uh, infrastructure that is there to enable them to be educative in the ways that they are intended to be. And I'll stop there. And because I have to leave at 9.30 for another talk, um, if you want any, if there are any questions, I could take them before I go. Great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Hammond. Uh, because she, we are going to lose her shortly, um, we're going to change things up given that uh, this is a study session. So, um, commissioners, if you can direct your questions. Um, to Linda right now, um, we have about a 10 minute window as she said, so uh, let's go ahead and move forward with that before we continue with Dr. Peck and the rest of the panelists. So questions um, from commissioners or comments? Commissioner Hartwig. Uh, good morning, Professor Hammond. I was interested just a little bit in um, so I know that you have a very national perspective on the development of performance assessments. I was interested just historically a little bit about whether the way that we uh, have designed and implemented our performance assessments in California has benefited at all from lessons that we have learned from other states and whether as we move forward thinking about our performance assessments, whether there are other models that you think are particularly effective and important for informing our work here in the state of California. Well, you know, we were the pioneers. So um, many other states have picked up on, you know, the initial work that, that we did. Um, and so we, but we're in, you know, often in conversation with folks in other states. Um, I think some of the implementation lessons that I mentioned come from both California and from other places. Uh, and I think it's important to be alert to what's going on nationally. But we have the most, um, I think, highly developed set of performance assessments of any, of any state in the country right now. We did learn a lot from Connecticut and Massachusetts, both of which had administrator performance assessments uh, before we did. Uh, and um, I think, the, for example, the way in which to focus in those assessments on um, the uh, uh, examination of and support for teaching was an idea that we brought, you know, from from those uh, other states that had gotten ahead of us. But I think that based on what I've heard from our colleagues, we've improved a great deal on what they did in both of those states, or at least our colleagues um, feel that, that that our assessment is more authentic, um, more grounded uh, in real world practice um, than than either of those that we learn from, and we appreciate that learning. Thank you, Commissioner Hartwig. Um, <clears throat> Linda, I have a question for you. Um, you talked about the support and infrastructure that's necessary um, for this to be effective. Can you share a little bit more, maybe just an example, one or two of the support and infrastructure um, that is so important for these performance assessments to work? I can say a word, and I know that uh, Dr. Peck has, uh, is an expert on this, and he's going to say a lot more about that. So I'll just say a word now. Um, I'll just speak from my own experience, um, you know, the program in which I have been a teacher educator, um, which is uh, that it, you know, you need to be sure that a, uh, all, all of the supervisors and um, cooperating teachers and mentor teachers and faculty are aware of the assessment and what it is seeking to do and how it can be supported in the learning process for candidates from the very beginning, not just at the end of the year when people are scurrying around trying to figure out how to how to, to do that. So it's, it's very important for that to be there. It's very important for there to be a place we have it in our practicum um, where uh, there are um, opportunities for folks to get support. But we've also embedded, the, uh, for example, candidates have to think about what kind of a curriculum unit they want to teach. And so there's a part of the curriculum where you where you're developing a curriculum. And so that, you know, that is taken up in those courses uh, and, uh, and applied directly. One of the nice things about performance assessment is that it's not intended to be a gotcha. It's intended to allow you to prepare along the way because it's authentic, it doesn't have to be secret. 
um, you know, you know what you're going to be doing. And so you can be learning how to do it along the way and you can get some feedback along the way uh, as you're doing it. So I think that's one of the key things is that everyone needs to know how to embed it in the work that's going on throughout the um, preparation preparation year and then have specific people uh, who are who know they're uh, responsible for supporting the candidates in different parts of the assessment or in the process of the assessment overall. Then there are lots of questions that come up about how do we do, you know, videotaping and, you know, how do we um, integrate this and how do we upload it even into the platform? So it's important that those those things be known and, and prepared for. Um, you know, one of the um, the things that we've seen with um, other forms of standardized testing and teaching is that they have um, not produced evidence of strong relationship to teaching, but they have, they do uh, eliminate many, many, many candidates from teaching uh, and are even are very, very disparate um, by um, race and ethnicity in terms of the outcomes of the tests and the performance assessments um, are have generally speaking uh, stronger um, both pass rates and fewer disparities but those that really depends on in part people knowing how to um, approach the assessment thank you so much <clears throat> commissioners other questions uh, commissioner de la torre thank you madam chair uh, Dr. Hammond, I had a question about the uh, administrator's uh, performance assessment. I know that during my tenure on the Board of Directors for the National Board with um, Heidi Commissioner Rodriguez, um, we did develop a, a principal certification. We, we oversaw that development, and it was very promising. The results came very well. Um, however, due to uh, lack of infrastructure, it seemed to just stop. Do you remember that, Heidi? And, but I know that the work that we did on that was very promising. So has that work been um, incorporated in the California's development of uh, administrator performance assessments? Well, we certainly learned from everybody who'd done work on this, including the National Board, as you know, some part of the beginning place. And the good news about a performance assessment that's embedded in preparation is that you can provide an infrastructure, right? There are people um, who are responsible for helping you get prepared for that job. Whereas once you get out into the field, you know, the national board is for veteran uh, principals. Um, it, there's not a clear infrastructure of people to support those principals. And um, you know, we didn't yet have um, support systems emerging. Uh, but certainly there was a lot of great work done on that assessment. And that filtered into the work in Connecticut and informed the work in Massachusetts all over to help to inform our work. Thank you. Other commissioners? Chair Sloan. Good morning, Linda. Thank you for being here. Um, yesterday we had a lot of letters that were uploaded. Um, and it, within those letters, there were a number of concerns about, uh, primarily they were talking about the ed TPA, but I guess both TPA and the use of them in general, as uh, disproportionately filtering out potential candidates or potential teachers of color. And I wonder if you could speak to that a bit. Well, in the work that has been going on, you know, um, since we started the pact and since, you know, um, ETA began, there were, there have been very um, small differentials uh, between candidates by race. I remember in some of the studies that I was uh, familiar with in those days, we had no disparity uh, by race in California. In Washington State, they found that they had a disparity for Latinx teachers uh, that did not appear in California, so it depends on the context. Um, but in the uh, last cycles, uh, I think during the pandemic, uh, the data I saw suggests that there has been more of a differential that is emerging in uh, performance assessments. And having done some uh, analysis of uh, the uh, data from the candidates coming in in California, one of the other things that is striking is that uh, black candidates in particular are coming in disproportionately through emergency routes 
and intern programs, like only half had access to student teaching. And I think those are problems that are going to show up. Uh, that the fundamental problem is that they're not getting the right support and preparation, but it's going to show up in a performance assessment that requires that support uh, in order to be able to demonstrate what you're learning and what you know. So I think it's something to always be alert to. I will say the disparities on the standardized tests, however, uh, have traditionally been and are in California significantly larger. Take a look at the results on the CSET, for example. So the performance assessment um, is not the place where that problem is the greatest, let me put it that way. Um, the other piece of the puzzle, of course, and um, we always have to think about two hands clapping. You know, the commission is responsible for um, what the standards are, but the rest of the state infrastructure has to provide the support systems uh, for the programs and the candidates and everyone else. So we do have now about $3 billion that's just come into the system this year for Golden State scholarships so that people can get um, $20,000 to support their preparation and be able to afford student teaching. Uh, I think it's $350 million for residencies so people can come into programs where they're actually um, getting reduced tuition costs and earning a stipend and uh, able to get the supports and draw down a scholarship so that they can afford to get the teaching um, supports that everybody wants and needs for them to have on the way into teaching. So those things are going to have to continue to go um, hand in glove for everyone. Um, I'll just sort of leave it at that. Thank you. Great, thank you everyone. We are at time for Linda. Um, appreciate everyone indulging us in having these questions asked and answered right now. And Linda, most of all, we thank you for your time and your expertise. And we'll move on to Dr. Peck. Have a great day. Thanks. Great to see you. Great. OK. Uh, we all now know the tenor and the momentum around this conversation. And we're now going to turn to our next speaker, Dr. Peck. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I'm going to take a little bit different approach to this. Um, um, uh, in 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 large matter because in deference to Linda's vastly superior knowledge of the policy issues and and really the research in this area, um, I I did have the opportunity recently to conduct with a, with uh, my colleagues um, Maya Goodman Young and Wen Chi Zhang here at University what I think is the most comprehensive review of the research on TPA implementation that's been done. And, and um, that document uh, is available through the National Educa Academy of Education, and, and it may well be of interest uh, to you. Um, but today, what I'd actually like to do, and, and what Linda encouraged me to do, is talk a little bit more about my practical experience as a teacher educator with the implementation of, of teaching performance assessments. Um, the, the ugly truth of it is I've been doing this for 20 years. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm happy to say that, that I think I've learned some things along the way, made lots of mistakes, um, some of them more than once. Um, uh, but what I'd like to talk with you about today is, is what I've learned and what we've learned about doing this work and doing it well and what can happen when you do it well. Um, so um, I actually uh, spent some uh, very interesting time last night reflecting on those experiences. I'm just gonna read this thing that I wrote to you uh, and, and apologize in advance for whether it, if that doesn't you know, work as well as it, as it might. So um, if you work in a teacher education program and especially if you work in several of them, like me, it's not hard to see what's going wrong. I've worked in four of them by the time I got to UC Santa Barbara in 2001. And I knew what the problems were. But if you don't know, and especially if you don't know in that rich and nuanced way that comes from actually working in, a te in teacher ed, I would highly recommend that you read John Goodlad's work, particularly Teachers for Our Nation's Schools. That was published way back in 1990. And it was, it is still the most in-depth field study of teacher education programs that we have, in, in my view. It's the most comprehensive, insightful, and dispiritingly contemporary description of the way we do teacher education in the United States. The fundamental problem is that things are just so chopped up in this work. Coursework, fieldwork, 
tenure line faculty, graduate students, field supervisors, cooperating teachers, everyone has their own piece of the elephant. Everyone is working hard in their own silo of practice. Faculty seldom know in any concrete way what's going on in one another's courses. Field supervisors don't know what's being taught on campus. Cooperating teachers have very little concrete knowledge of the university program and have no idea usually on who to even call to find out. These problems are not equally evident in all programs, but they're widely evident across programs. They're not the result of disinterest, lack of skill or caring among the people doing the work. They're rooted in the ways the work is organized within and across institutions. So one of the first worst effects of weak organizational connections between the people, the ideas, and the settings in which teacher education is carried out is that it's really hard for people doing the work to communicate with one another. That means it's very hard to understand problems, much less solve them. It's hard to get on the same page. And it's hard to learn from your own experiences. And it's particularly hard to learn as a collective and as a program. So I knew all of this when I arrived at UCSB in 2001 as the new director of teacher education there. But while I had lived with these problems in multiple programs, I really had no idea about how to engage them. And to make matters even more complicated, the state had recently passed Senate Bill 2042, Linda uh, referred to that briefly, which among things mandated that all teacher education programs would implement a teaching performance assessment. It was not a high stakes test at that point, but it was required. And teacher educators, including those at UC Santa Barbara, were hopping mad about it. And at first I was mad with them, but no doubt after a few drinks, we began to realize that we had no choice. The pro program approval was at stake with this and the best pass really was to try to make the policy work for us if we could. There's a lot more to this story than I have time to tell you here, uh, but if you want, you can read about it in the in the publication that that uh, uh, I, I did with um, Tina and and Chrisanne Gallucci uh, was published in 2010, in which we document this whole process of learning and, and about implementation that we went through. But I want to hit on a few key things I learned through that early experience with TPAs, and they were things that we didn't see coming as we began to implement the assessment. It's important to begin to, with the understanding that we thought we had a really good program. And it, for me, it was actually the best program I'd ever seen when I arrived. And, and the props for that are due to John Snyder and many, many other talented and deeply committed folks who had been working there. So it was natural for us to try out the new TPA because we expected our students were going to do great on it. We fully expected that our candidates' performance on the assessment would affirm our positive views of our own program and our own work. And looking at the artifacts of their classroom practice were collected through the performance assessment, at first glance, that is what we saw. But when we scratched the surface, when we started looking at their work more closely, we began to see things that prompted this kind of comment. Hey, I taught that for three weeks last quarter and they didn't do it. Again and again, faculty saw evidence in both the videos and the written artifacts of classroom practice, that is the assessments, the lesson plans, the evaluations of student work, that showed that candidates were not implementing what they'd been taught in their coursework. We were stunned and we were really upset. And the realization that our students had actually not done nearly so well as we anticipated unleashed a huge amount of energy aimed at finding out why and undertaking whatever changes were needed to fix the problem. So that was really the first and perhaps the most important thing that we learned about TPAs. They provide a record of the extent to which candidates take up what they've been taught in coursework and actually implement in their own classroom practice or not. When faculty find out that what they've tried to teach has not been implemented, it breaks loose a tremendous amount of energy and commitment to change and improvement. Just imagine a university faculty, including a bunch of very researchy profs at a UC campus, taking up, getting all fired up about how change how they prepare teachers. It was exciting and they were fired up. Moreover, one of the things we quickly learned is that many of the problems that we saw in the TPA data could not be fixed by working alone. The silos were not going to do it. 
And faculty teaching, just for example, faculty teaching our courses related to supporting English learners, which were, by the way, rated really highly by all the candidates. Those faculty were dismayed to find out that candidates were not actually using the strategies they'd been taught when they were teaching math or science or literacy. And, and moreover, the faculty's first attempts at improving that outcome by changing their individual courses were only marginally effective. They found out that the, what they had to do was actually teach with the math and literacy faculty in order to get the candidates to see how supports for EL kids could be integrated into subject area instruction. So that was the second big thing that we learned from TPA. You have to work together across courses and across coursework and field work to solve many of our most important problems. We learned that working across those silos in practice was absolutely predicated on having a common and concrete language of practice so we could understand one another, so we could articulate problems in ways that were transparent and interpretable across people who otherwise did not work closely together. So the language that the TPA provided for us enabled us to get smarter and more efficient at working together in the precious hours that we had to do that. Learning to integrate a TPA into a teacher education program in a way that blends with, rather than competes with, other program and instructional priorities is not easy. It took hard work and it demanded innovation. In that context, state level supports for bringing programs together at TPA or PACT conferences is what they were then, um, to share what they were learning about these challenges was a huge help. We found when we gathered across programs now that we shared a common and concrete language of practice so that we could understand and build on one another's innovations much more easily than anything we'd ever experienced before at a conference. These connections were hugely energizing for us and they were, were uh, amazingly useful to the very practical work of figuring out how to implement the performance assessment and integrate it into the program in a way that made sense to the candidates and to the faculty. So the third thing that we learned from the TPAs um, is that it, this common language that we had developed through the assessment allowed us to collaborate and learn across programs in the state. So what our colleagues knew around the state became more accessible to us as resources for our own learning. And the innovations that were, were created in one campus became opportunities to improve practice across programs. All of this energy and excitement about what we were learning about our own practice and each other's practice had a huge effect on the program at UCSB. It changed our relationships with one another. TPAs are situated in actual classrooms. And as tenure faculty began to see, using the TPA data, more of what candidates were and were not doing in their classroom placements, they began talking more often and more deeply with field supervisors and paying much more attention to what those people knew. In the best cases, cooperating teachers also became more knowledgeable about TPA and the language assessment task and the data became shared objects that opened up new and very concrete conversations about our joint work of preparing teachers. The program became more democratic and more attentive, respectful and responsive to voices coming from the P12 classroom. That was the fourth lesson we learned through the TPA. The experience at UCSB has influenced everything I've done since. It taught me that there is an enormous untapped energy for change in almost every teacher educator once you make the need for change concrete, real, and personal. TPAs are a unique and precious tool for doing that because the kind of data they generate, which is uniquely tied to personal responsibilities that faculty, field supervisors, and cooperating teachers carry in teacher education programs. It matters to them because it's about their own work and the connection between what's shown up, shows up on the assessment and the work that individual people are doing in the program is very transparent. It's much more personal and concrete feedback than comes from a survey measure, much less value-added measures of, of program level impacts on K-12 student achievement. 
Those measures do have their own value to be sure, but they're much, much too abstract to carry the personal implications for change for teacher education practitioners in the way that TPA data can, particularly when the artifacts collected in the assessment portfolios are examined directly. That means getting past the scores to look at the stuff that people that candidates are creating in the classroom, and of course you can't do that for every portfolio. You have to get smart and 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 with a sampling procedure to do that. But the point is that that the real energy is opened up when faculty can see very concrete examples of what students have learned and what they haven't in the context of actually working in classrooms. So Linda play, uh, mentioned that I played a role in, in, in carrying PACT and later at TPA to the state of Washington. And, um, and I just have to say that that implementation process was also strongly supported by, by progressive leadership from uh, Pat Wozley at University of Washington, who was Dean at the time, and Jennifer Wallace, who was executive director of our state standards board. We had our own victories and our experiences confirmed each of those lessons I named, I just named. But perhaps most important, our experiences in Washington State underscored the importance of building state level supports for learning across programs. Our efforts to sustain TPA policy implementation in Washington have sadly enough weakened over time. And I think that is in large measure due to a loss of focus on the function of TPAs as unique and powerful opportunities for learning. And not just individual learning, but collective program level learning. So I'll, I'll just end by naming this as the fifth lesson. The energetic core of program improvement is not about accountability, it's about learning. What all five of those lessons suggest to me is that a key question for policymakers should be how can we best support learning processes at the, both the program and inter-program level? My experiences over the last 20 years suggest that, that, that TPAs can be a uniquely important tool for supporting those kinds of processes. But a tool is only a tool. How it works and whether it works depends on how it's used. It's quite clear that many folks interpret TPAs not as an opportunity for learning, but as a burden. I think there's some things that policymakers like CCTC can do to help people recognize and take up the opportunities to learn that are available through the implementation of TPA. First of all, you know, the state of California has really been exemplary in its support for this, this kind of work. And I think it's, it, it's important to recognize the importance of certain kinds of functions, particularly bringing programs together to share what they're learning and how they're learning from TPAs. My advice would be to conceptualize that learning around the general concept of a TPA, that is sidestepping questions about which tool is best and focusing more on fundamental questions about what these kinds of data help us learn. A second thing that I think would be really helpful is for the state to be active in sponsoring leadership development opportunities focused on the kinds of leadership skills that are important in creating opportunities for individual and collective learning and teacher education programs. Third, I think that identifying successful cases of TPA implementation and learning and making them visible to the state and nation is quite important. Even though I'm far away from y'all now in Washington state, I hear about sites of energetic and creative learning that are thriving in California. I think about Fresno State, I hear about that. I hear about the work going on at San Bernardino State and particularly the group of young scholars that are hard at work making the new Cal TPA responsive to, to concerns around equity. I know that you all are deeply involved in doing this kind of work already. Um, I think the rest of the country is pay, pays attention to that and draws considerable hope around the possibility of making progress around these, this kind of work based on what you, you've done in California for some time now. I also know there's plenty of pushback right now. I read the, the uh, comments that, that uh, Tina sent um, uh, that have come into the commission. And, and one thing I wanna say is I, I have huge respect for those, the concerns that are expressed in those comments and the values underlying those concerns. I'm concerned that, that discarding a measure which reveals some of the discrepancies 
in, in our achievements in preparing candidates to succeed with the EdTPA, EdTPA or TPAs in general and succeed in the classroom, that eliminating that measure, signal of a problem makes it invisible, makes it less visible. And, I, and, and in that context, I think of one of the studies that re we reviewed uh, when we just did our massive uh, uh, review of the literature around, around TPA implementation was carried out by, some, uh, by Williams and, and her colleagues, I think uh, about two years ago. And they studied the pass rates of, of candidates um, in a large teacher prep program in Texas. And, and one of the things they saw was that there was a discrepancy in pass rates uh, for black students and, and white students. But the really interesting thing is they, they, they collected data on what the expectations were of all the candidates going into the EdTPA. And they found that, the, the, that black candidates expected themselves to do better than the white candidates did, but ended up doing worse. Now, that study raises some really interesting questions for me. Um, and, and you can't answer those questions based on the data that we're collecting. But one of the issues that it raises is what kind of feedback the black candidates were getting from their instructors, from their field supervisors about their readiness to, to take the test. I don't know what happened, but it raises the possibility that the that differences in the preparation that candidates had, differences in what they were told about their readiness for the assessment may have played a role in, in what happened. We don't know. We need to know. We need to do research that investigates the issues that are arising around this. And I, and I think we're in, in quite, uh, quite uniform alignment ar around that need. But the point that this study raises for me is that if you don't have the measure, then you don't know what's happening. You can't see that th the problem, the possible problem that, that some candidates are getting more direct and more useful feedback about their readiness to perform the assessment than others. So I think um, I'll end there um, and I'm happy to take whatever questions uh, you have. And I, again, I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, talk with you today. No, thank you, Dr. Peck, for the <clears throat> for your presentation and your enthusiasm for it. So we're going to just keep kind of breaking with the mold. And um, if commissioners have questions before we lose Dr. Peck. We'll go ahead and ask him questions before we move to the panel. Um, so questions by commissioners. Yes, Commissioner Hartwick. Oh, good morning, Dr. Peck. This was very um, educational for me, especially as I'm someone who's a public representative and so doesn't come with a deep knowledge of these. Uh, you had several policy suggestions for us to consider, and the second one had to do with creating leadership opportunities. Um, could you just say a little bit more about what you mean by that suggestion? I, I'm happy to. I'll, 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 I'm happy to do that. I think it's a hugely important topic. I just want to note that your, um, your uh, um, Commissioner Sloan is actually probably the person that knows the most about this of anybody in the country. Uh, but, I, but I will just say that, that um, leadership is critical to any kind of program improvement effort you wanna undertake in, in teacher education. And skilled letter leadership um, is, is not something that you discover, you learn it. And, and I think that it, that bringing people together to talk about what they've learned about how to motivate, support, and, 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 um, and lead program improvement work, and particularly evidence-based program improvement work, is, is a really crucial thing. If we want to make progress on any of the program improvement agendas that we have, the, the, the TPA is only one front 
of our efforts and your efforts to improve teacher education programs, but none of them go very far at, in terms of changing the guts of a program. Unless people are brought together and unless time and space are created, that's a leadership responsibility. Um, in, unless the reward structure that operates in universities, which is very problematic for getting people to actually do the, ver the difficult and time consuming work of program improvement, uh, those things need to be addressed. And those are leadership tasks. Um, so there's a lot to be learned about how to do it. And I think that the state is in the, an ideal position to sponsor like an annual leadership institute focused on program improvement and lead, leading for program improvement. Um, I'd love to see you do it. You're leading the nation in almost every other way. So why not that too? <laughs> well, thank you for that compliment and for that information. Thank you. Commissioner Grenoshire. Good morning, Cap. It's Marquita. I just wanted to uh, thank you for the uh, honesty of telling the story of how difficult this work really is. And I think um, your personal journey, um, the research that you have done has made a tremendous contribution to the field. And so um, I know many of the commissioners don't have the deep understanding that you do, but just the way you constructed and shared the story, I think, was really, really helpful. So I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. That's a high compliment coming from you. <laughs> well, the majority of teachers I hire are from UCSB, and I can say that that is a fantastic program. <laughs> okay. In your, in your comments, the, the sort of words that I picked out were, uh, weak institutional connections, uh, the idea that it should be democratic, attentive, concrete, real, and personal. And all of those things make me wonder if our move to statewide scoring was the right move. So I, I wonder if you have any ideas on how this body could make the TPA more democratic, attentive, real, and personal to our candidates when I get the feeling, at least from reading letters, that they, the perception of students is that it is, the TPA is disembedded from what matters most to them. Well, I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I, I missed the, the, what you said about the move to, is it change the scoring pro, um, policies? I, well, somebody from an IHE should probably speak to this rather than me, but we made a move a few years ago away from local scoring to statewide scoring. And oh. Tina, if you could say that better. Yeah, I, I am familiar with this issue, uh, quite familiar actually. Um, so it's a dilemma, isn't it? Because scoring the TPAs is a huge time commitment. And, and I understand because people are already work so hard in this field. I, I, I mean, I, it drives me nuts when folks are disrespectful of, what, of the work going on in teacher ed because it just means they don't know. Um, so people are, work so hard and their plates are so full. So it's hard to put anything else on them. On the other hand, if you think of learning to score as the heart of the process of learning the language, learning that concrete and practice-based language that allows you to collaborate with your colleagues and to make programs more coherent, then you start wondering whether it's smart to outsource that learning process. I think that, as I understand, California has a policy that, that either enables or maybe it requires that, that programs retain a portion of their candidates to score internally. And I think that might be a good that might be a good compromise, but outsourcing scoring is outsourcing the opportunity to learn. And, and what that looks like is that this, the learning to score is about learning to see things in a similar way and evaluate them in a similar way. And that's the essence of learning a language. I mean, when, when we're little kids, we learn to name things by, you know, our, our parents hold something up and say, you know, that's not a good example. This is a pencil. And they point to it, and it's a and it's a shared object, and that's how we learn language. So if we don't have shared objects that we learn to name together, 
then we, we don't communicate very effectively together. We, and it takes us a huge amount of time to collaborate. And, and I mean, anybody that's worked in the school system knows that collaboration is both one of the most important things and one of the most expensive things to, to do. So, so learning a, a, a concrete and common language of practice is a huge advantage to making the time spent in collaboration matter to creating more coherent and, 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 and widely shared and widely implemented decisions about program improvement. I hope that was responsive to your question. I, um, yes, thank you. Great. Other commissioners with other questions? Uh, Commissioner Sloan, Chair Sloan. Good morning, Cap. Thank you for being here. Um, not only, <clears throat> as others have said, you have vast experience with working with TPAs within your own programs that you have worked in as a teacher educator, but you have also conducted one of the most comprehensive reviews of teacher performance assessments nationwide, uh, most recently. And one of the things that <clears throat> some people um, would interpret as a criticism and others as um, important information about performance assessments and our candidates' uh, abilities to uh, perform on those has to do with the contexts in which they've been learning to teach and the contexts in which they're actually doing the assessment, <clears throat> which is in their classrooms, of course, because it is about um, it's a performance assessment. Could you say a little bit more about the differential effects of context and what we might take away from that? Well, um, first thing I would say is that I think it's a serious issue. And, and, and Linda uh, uh, mentioned some of the context in which it's particularly problematic. When, when candidates are exposed to dramatically different opportunities to learn in the field, in student teaching, some people, you know, uh, applying for, for uh, licensure without having student taught, that's an issue. And, 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 and so in addition to really dramatic issues in, in differences in context and differences in opportunities to learn, there are more, there are su more subtle issues as well. And I think that um, Kevin Bastian's uh, study last year, um, which did show some effects of the competence of the cooperating teacher that, uh, uh, on the, the ed TPA performance of candidates. Now that shouldn't be a surprise to us because all of us in teacher ed are constantly in a churn of trying to find the best placements we possibly can. And we compete for those cross programs. So we know it matters. And, and I think the, the, the assessments are built in ways that focus as much as possible on the individual practice of, of, um, of candidates in ways that, that, that are, are not profoundly affected by contextual variables. But the, but the truth of the matter is, in my view, is that we don't know enough about that yet. And so I think it's a serious set of questions. I don't think the field has grappled with it conceptually or, or psychometrically. Um, and um, so I don't know if that's what you, anyhow that, I think it's a real issue. Yep, thank you. And um, it's a good reminder that in your insert, um, all of the studies by Linda and Dr. Peck, and including Chair Sloan, are included. So if folks want to go deeper, um, other questions? Okay, Commissioner Davis, how are you? Uh, more of a comment than a, than a question. Good morning, um, Dr. Peck. Um, I'm one of those rare unicorns. I didn't have any student teaching, and I started with an emergency teaching permit back in the 90s. and. I remember uh, the evolution of the T, the TPAs, and, um, and and the bits of program that you know I essentially had to complete not once but twice because I moved from district to district, um, and that's when it was one of those things that was mandated. Um, I, I wanted to to talk about a little bit about the the folks that are at the table, as you and um, and Dr. Hammond 
so eloquently uh, stated about how teachers of color sometimes are slighted um, and and the, the data shows that um, that there isn't an equivalent pass rate for teachers of color, especially African Americans. Um, I I wonder who's at the table. I mean, I haven't read your study, and I haven't read the complete history, and I I I will do that. Uh, who's at the table creating the assessments? Um, is it a diverse body like this one? Um, is when I and and I'll preface it with this. When I went through uh, LA State, um, and I remember um, one of my cherished professors here at the table with us um, from LA State, um, I was in the, uh, the teacher preparation program and I remember the entire faculty being Caucasian, the, the entire faculty. There was no diversity whatsoever in that department. And so when I got an observing professor who came out, a field professor who'd come out to observe my class. Even though I had an emergency teaching permit, I still had to complete that portion of the credential program. Her first comment to me was, I appreciate um, you colored people dressing with a tie for work every day. So that was my first interaction with a university professor in a credential program who was supervising me. And so I got that comment again. I've worn a tie every day to work for almost 30 years. And this is just how I dress. This is my uniform. But my, my, my point is the institutional attitude toward people of color often affects that scaffolding or that whatever presentation is given to those teachers of color. And sometimes these traumatic psychological digs at my skin color affect my performance more than anything else. So I go into a classroom in a high need school in South Central Los Angeles and I try my best to be the best possible teacher. No one prepares me for the trauma that I'm going to receive from my students, nor my, my, my background, my baggage that comes with that. And so those TPAs that I've um, helped uh, 20 candidates complete over the years because I host a student teacher every year uh, in my classroom as a practicing teacher now. Um, I've helped them get through that. Almost none of those TPAs address those things and I understand that we're going through a process of improvement and, and, and looking at those items. But they're, the TPAs often do not address the local issues or the local things that teachers are kind of continuing with on a day-to-day. -day. So sometimes the TPAs are kind of like way out in left field as far as what they're preparing the new teachers uh, for. And I, and I get we need to have a common practice. We need to have a common measurement of the success of whether a teacher candidate is um, appropriately placed as a teacher because sometimes this career path is not for everyone. Of course, we know that. And so how do we, with the intersectionality of those things, how do we bridge that gap and that divide where we have teachers of color at the table helping with that and then culturally responsive assessing and also the community speaking of their needs because I think in the TPAs there needs to be some sort of localized language that addresses the needs of the community as opposed to a blanket. This is the way it is in California because it definitely isn't that way in South Central Los Angeles and where I work now in San Jose it definitely isn't that way in uh, San Jose. So how do we bridge that? And that's kind of that's not an actual question, but it's sort of a hypothetical question <laughs> because it's not something that can be answered right now, I, I imagine, but of course we could speak to it. Thank you. Well, if I was to try to answer, you'd laugh at me, I'm sure, because what you've raised is, I, I, I mean, all, all I can do is, is express respect and affirmation for every single point you just made. And I don't see a way forward uh, that that um, that isn't about that conversation that you just raised, um, and so I I appreciate it, and I think that we have to to engage it. And I know I don't understand it, uh, and I'm not going to pretend to. Uh, but I respect it, and and I think that that 
that conversation, I think all of us are trying to get better at having it. That doesn't mean we are getting better. Um, I, I am encouraged by some of what I've been learning and hearing about the new Cal TPA as representing a pretty strategic effort to build, rebuild an assessment with much more careful listening to the kinds of issues you've just raised. Um, but you know, the fact of the matter is we have a lot to, to make up for. Uh, we have a lot to learn and um, and I, I appreciate you raising every, every issue you just raised. And I, I appreciate the fact that you got through that pathway and you've become, obviously, here you are sitting on the commission, uh, an influential and, and powerful member of the, of the policy making community in the state. So that tells me, among other things, that tells me that we have to be careful about the judgments we make based on teaching performance assessments and all of the other measures because they erase so much of who people are and they, they can. So we have to be thoughtful and conservative, conservative and, and, and careful in, in, in the way we use these data. Um, and I think the example that you just gave of your own navigation of the perils of becoming a, becoming a teacher in the, in, in, given the supports that you had um, are a really good example of that. So I guess I'll just end by saying thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. And thank you, Dr. Peck. I, I think your, your comment actually is a really good time, unless there's other questions, to, tr to transition to the rest of our panelists for TPA, Cal, APA candidates, faculty, and program coordinators. Does, do folks have other, other questions before we move to the rest of our panel? Dr. Peck, I just really want to thank you again for your enthusiasm and for showing us the formative and summative nature and everything that is involved in this work and um, for answering our questions so comprehensively. So thank you so, so much. And if you can stay, you're welcome to continue to join the conversation, but I don't know your schedule. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to stick around at least for a few minutes to see if people want something and want me to respond to something. So I'll, I'll hang in for a, for a bit. Okay. Um, Amy, do you want to lead off this next section? Thank you so much. Thank you, and good morning, commissioners. Um, I would like to introduce the panel members who are going to speak, our practitioners that have come to be with us today. So we have a mixed, a mixed in the sense that we have some online. You can see Terrell, Dr. Sales up there in front of you, and we have some who are able to join us in person. So I'm going to start by just introducing them by name and then invite them if they'd like to say more about themselves when they begin. They all understand that they each have about two minutes to express uh, their positions. We do have a very busy agenda, uh, and we so much appreciate that they could be here with us. Um, so I'm going to start by saying uh, Terrell Sales is joining us. He's an assistant professor um, of teacher education at Pepperdine, and he will speak to the Cal TPA. He will be followed by Janelle Richardson, who is a candidate who has completed the Cal TPA recently. She is a digital media arts teacher at Golden Valley High School, Rook William S. Hart Union High School District. She's a single subject teacher um, and got her single subject at the University of Laverne, and she is, also holds a CTE credential from San Diego. Followed by Janelle will be Jennifer Critch, who is here at the table with us. Uh, Dr. Critch is an Associate Professor of Education at, um, and Director of Special Ed at Point Loma National, uh, Nazarene University. And she will speak to the uh, Education Specialist Cal TPAs that will be following this panel discussion. And then here uh, uh, to my left is Dr. Brian Lim joining us. He is a professor at CSU Sacramento College of Education, Department of Teaching Credentials. Welcome. And Julia Michelson will follow. Uh, Dr. Lim will talk to the Ed TPA. And uh, Dr. Um, Walt Waltheimer will speak to FAST. <laughs> so she has also come to join us. She is an associate professor, literacy education, assistant director, teacher ed, the Kremen School of Education and Human Development, director of the San Joaquin Valley Writing Project, uh, and works at California Cal State University Fresno. Followed by our TPA folks, we then have two more presenters. Um, we are joined here today 
uh, by Dr. Stephen Winlock, who will speak to the Cal APA, the Administrative Performance Assessment you heard about. He is with the Sacramento County Office of Education and is the Executive Director of the School of Education there. Welcome, Dr. Winlock. And Sumit Sin will be with us. He is the candidate who has recently completed the Cal APA, and he is a math teacher and teacher lead at Monterey Trail High School, Elk Grove USD. So welcome to all of you. And with that, we're going to start with Dr. Uh, Sales. So Terrell, if you would begin. Thank you for joining us. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Terrell Sales. As uh, Amy stated, I am an assistant professor at Pepperdine University, a teacher preparation program. Um, I am a product of Los Angeles Unified School District. Um, born and raised in South Los Angeles, and I'm very happy to be here to speak about um, the efficacy of the Cal TPA. I believe the Cal TPA does a great job of preparing novice teachers to further engage in research-based best practices and critical pedagogies that are essential to the teaching profession, particularly in preparing teachers who are not from traditionally marginalized population, begin the important work of actively addressing, engaging, and altering both implicit and explicit biases and deficit thinking practices that they may have towards students of color, English learners, and students with exceptionalities. I believe that Cal TPA's tenets of plan, teach, and assess, reflect, and apply are essential staples that when adequately utilized and effectively taught by faculty help prepare future beginning teachers to practice and develop teaching strategies and learning activities that are pertinent and important to their growth, not only in the science and methodology of teaching, but also in the art and the heart of teaching. I firmly believe that the Cal TPA is best utilized as a learning tool for preparing future beginning teachers as well as faculty members to create meaningful, culturally sustaining, anti-bias, anti-racist, student-informed, student-centered lesson plans, curriculum, and assessments that push beginning teachers as well as faculty members towards greater understanding and application of culturally sensitive and or culturally sustaining practices. All things that we know constitute great teaching. I believe this assessment when used as a learning tool also helps many beginning educators make sense of universal design for learning in very practical and tangible ways. I know I only have two minutes, so I'll stop there because I want to be um, uh, courteous to the other panelists as well. But those are my thoughts on the Cal TPA um, and I'm thankful for your time. Janelle is joining us online. Janelle, we'll turn it to you. Hi there. Good morning. Um, I want to uh, mention that I am also one of those rare unicorns. I, I started the program later in life, um, and I am a mother of four, and I was hired as an intern. Um, when Dr. Peck said uh, uh, burden versus learning opportunity, I think both of those words completely uh, uh, define how I felt about the TPA. Um, however, the experience uh, taught me the true expectations and performance level that I should expect of myself as well as deliver to my students. Um, because I did not receive student teaching, I don't think there was anything else that could have prepared me better. It helped me understand the details of my professional duty to implement equity and differentiation to all of my students. Um, it helped me gain strength in developing and providing the students with the best uh, educational plan, implementation, assessment, and reflection. It has influenced me by increasing my abilities in all areas, and it definitely was the best bridge um, going into uh, induction to be able to assess all of those CSTP areas. Um, I'm very grateful for the experience. It definitely was um, it was a beast, uh, but uh, had I not done it, I would not be uh, the teacher that I'm growing at, uh, growing as now. Um, most importantly, it helps me um, to be able to uh, reflect on my teaching practice. Uh, it taught me that so that I could continue to improve. So I'm very thankful for the experience. Thank you, Janelle. And we're going to turn to Dr. Critch. Oh, 
Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for having me. The TPA started back at my university back in 2008, and we decided that we were going to follow the rule that teaching that all teachers teach all, and we are going to include our special ed candidates with the TPA. So our special ed candidates in 2008 started taking the TPA, and we had some challenges because they had to do their student teaching and those performance assessments in a gen ed classroom. We figured out a way to do it, but it was difficult. We had a lot of, a lot of people fail because we had local scoring, and we had um, places where candidates struggled because they were really interns bridging the gap, trying to teach gen ed students while they had their special ed students. Um, but it really helped us focus early in the program on UDL when they went in 2016 to the, they went from four, four TPAs to two. It really helped us focus early in the curriculum on UDL and it helped us equip them to better learn about students, getting to know the students. It helped us design assessments that reflected the jagged learning profiles of all students. And some of the challenges we found, it was harder for interns um, because they got thrown right in. They, while they were in the program, they were trying to juggle being a full-time teacher with being a full-time student. And um, that, that takes a lot. And when she said it was a beast, it's a beast of a performance assessment, but it really helps us know what teachers know? Do they know how to plan? Do they know how to teach? Can they assess? And then can they reflect and apply that later in the, their um, later lessons? It really helped us um, look more seriously at the benefits and it helped them see themselves teaching. So the videos that they had to provide, they could actually, oh wait, I said that? I didn't mean to say that. So that, that was uh, one of the benefits. Um, one thing that we hope that our teacher candidates can begin to overcome are the teachers in the field because a lot of teachers in the field those of us who've been out there for 20 plus 30 plus years didn't have to go through a tpa and udl all those things are new and so our teacher candidates and this is a challenge are hearing it's not that important udl doesn't really matter so hopefully they're getting into the field changing those ideas about what learning looks like and that jagged learning profiles are some kids are going to be great in some things and they're not going to be so great in other things um, one of the the best things about being in that beginning stage with the gen ed even though um, special ed now you'll hear is having their own special ed tpa uh, it helped us be able to embed all of this performance assessment in the beginning of our program. So we're able to really drill down into the TPEs that are associated with the extensive needs, support needs, and the mild mod support needs students. Because real life is performance assessment. And in our performance assessments, we look at three focus students, an EL student, a, special, a student with special needs, and then we, we look at students who are trauma-based. Um, um, so students who maybe are um, homeless or in foster care. So we are beginning to look at trauma. I think that is something that we need to be in conversations about. And it's giving our teachers a way to show us authentically what they know and how to deliver it. It helps us understand that teaching isn't, you don't close your door anymore. Teaching isn't a silo. We're, t we're doing this together. And it's the analytic rubrics that are keeping us looking at the teaching. We're looking at the um, aspect of teaching. We're not looking at the person who is teaching. So um, those analytic rubrics really help us focus on the aspects of the teacher pre um, preparation expectations. And I like what Dr. Peck said about having a common and concrete language of practice. Really, the, the performance assessment has done that. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out is it's helped our program improve. We, we were able to look at the things that we weren't doing well because now we had common concrete language to center our, um, our analyses on. So it helped us realize that in collaboration with others, we really can uh, work better for all of the teachers in California. Thank you, Dr. Critch. And following uh, Dr. Critch, we will have Dr. Brian Lin speak to the EdTPA. Hi, um, I've been teaching, um, doing uh, teacher training for 24 years. So, um, so it's, when I first came to Sacramento State and started uh, teacher training, there was no performance assessment. So Dr. Peck and Dr. Hammer already talked about being 
a lot of professors being silos, and it was silos. And we had a big program, and every professor was on their individual classroom. But after um, performance assessment required in 2007, we stopped meeting together as a, each courses. We met together. PEG required had to have a signature assignment. So each course, we have to have a signature assignment. So no matter who teaches, we have to have the same assignment. So that we start communicating. And when we moved to LTPA, LTPA didn't require signature assignment, but we combined what we did in PEG. We still have a signature assignment. So as a program, it was a big opportunity. I'm also a multiple subject program coordinator. So I asked them to meet together and decide what the signature assignment is and how to improve um, the performance assessment. So we look at the data every year, compare with the national data and California data because ATP uh, provides all those information and compare to our institution's data and see which area we need to work on. So it really improves our program. And before pandemic, one, sem one semester, you know, pretty much everybody passed the uh, ATP on time. So we really um, look at the data to improve our program. It shows, and, and someone brought up about, um, you know, the passing rate of teacher of color. And we do have a lot of teacher of color at Sacramento State. And we're trying to look into that. But passing rate is so high, it doesn't make any difference, you know, whether we do LTPA or whatever uh, our performance assessment we look at it. So um, I think we have to look at an individual program and see how they improve now, instead of looking at just color, uh, teacher of colors. Because if you have a good program, then they'll do well on performance assessment. And um, it's not perfect. It does uh, add stress, and it does make a challenge to our program because you know, someone brought up about the context. Uh, we do place our student teachers, the multiple subject, in Title I schools because we want them to experience the diverse student background. And when our candidate end up in school district where they're very script curriculum and they have to follow pacing guide and everybody on exactly the same chapter, it's very difficult to do performance assessment because they have to we engage the students and they don't have opportunity to do that. And they cannot use that in their performance assessment. So actually we have one of the school districts. We don't, we, unless we know the uh, cooperating teacher, we don't place them because the challenge we have. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kim. We're gonna follow up with Juliet, speaking to FAST, the Fresno performance. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, as Amy said, I'm uh, from Fresno State, and um, at Fresno State, we do things a little bit differently from the rest of California. Um, we have the Fresno Assessment of Student Teachers, or the FAST, which is the only uh, commission-approved performance assessment um, at, based at an IHE in California. Um, and I shared with you a little bit about that back in February, but just as a reminder, it contains two components, the site visitation project, and then uh, that's completed in the next to last semester of the candidate's placement in the program, and then the teaching sample project, which is completed in their final semester. Um, and these are scored primarily by coaches and, fa well, by coaches and faculty. Um, I will say most of the scoring happens, or more of the scoring happens by coaches rather than faculty, but we are able to then use the learning from that scoring to inform work with our candidates, as was talked about this morning. Um, really, it's we are a model of an embedded performance assessment where we can use that learning to inform the work we do. Um, and just coincidentally, I started doing some surveys um, really earlier this month, but before I knew about this opportunity to speak with you all, um, of our coaches and our faculty and of completers of our program who completed um, over the last five years, but at least a year ago. So who've been in classrooms for at least a year. So um, from the coaches, um, a survey of 67 who scored the FAST in this last academic year. I had 44 who responded. Of those, 42 indicated that the scoring the FAST helped them as they coach their student teachers. Um, one quote I have is, along with being an, a conversation opener, it helped me to become familiar with the TPEs and gave me something to focus on with the students over the course of the semester. Um, 35 of the 44 indicated they used the site visitation plan and or the teaching uh, site visitation project, I'm sorry, and or the teaching sample project as tools to support them in their coaching. Uh, one said, when I discuss various practices with my student teachers, I connect it to the FAST. 
For one example, when discussing the importance of relationship building to student learning, I show the students how the class profile and students in context aspects of the FAST is a helpful tool for getting to know your students. I also use the FAST rubric to discuss the TPEs associated with the FAST and then help student teachers at goals in these areas that I can also observe for in their formal lesson implementations. I feel like that's just a perfect example of how the FAST is truly integrated into the work we do. Um, program completers, that was, um, you know, I sent the survey to the email addresses I had on file for the 2,327 individuals who completed their multiple subject or single subject uh, credentials between fall 2017 and spring 2021. We are working on our system to track our graduates, um, so not a fantastic way of reaching them all, but I did have 95 respond, again, not fantastic response rate, but of those 95, 71, so 75% indicated that the FAST was at least somewhat helpful in preparing them for the work required for teaching. Um, one said, I remember the recommendation or requirement to plan lessons with particular students in mind in order to provide support for all students. That was a really helpful practice for me and I still use it today. I remember learning the importance of assessment to planning um, and responding to assessed student need. So um, challenges we have, I feel like they, I'm just echoing what um, Dr. Peck was talking about in terms of the need for the infrastructure to support this work. Um, I will say I don't feel like we have enough faculty that are really engaged in the scoring, and I don't think that we have um, enough structures in place at this time to be really thoughtful about um, analyzing the scores and making the connections between those scores and what we're doing in our classrooms. I have to laugh because I feel like it's the work that we're asking our candidates to do on the FAST with their assessments of their students, we're not doing a good enough job ourselves. So that's an area for us to improve on. But thank you again for this opportunity. Thanks, Amy. Do you know, um, I've been involved in leadership development for the last 30 years in the, in the issue about looking from, you know, being involved as a superintendent, being involved as a director of CSLA, the first one, many years ago. Um, but, you know, when I was thinking about that is that we keep trying to define what leadership needs to be for guiding our the education here for our kids in in California that's what the leadership really needs to be developed around what's going to improve our education and so I was thinking about that that we, we've had we have tools to kind of help us with that the California standards which are leadership standards are really clear that when these are in place this is what happens at a school we have effective schools we have all those kinds of things we have the the issue about looking at when we have like the uh, the dot which is the description of practice that was developed by the uh, West Ed. It, it shares what needs to be the leadership practices in each one of those standards that are involved in that. So as we, as we kind of look at all of these tools, I really believe that the, the Cal uh, APA has been just one of those tools that is helping us with developing what needs to be done for um, our leaders when they when take on that role in a lot of ways. And, you know, it, it's, it's building their understanding about what's expected of leadership. When you take on a school, you got to look at, you know, I was just looking at the, you know, in cycle one, we talk about the issue about looking at data and reviewing data and kind of understanding that. And then from that data, you're to build your, your, your focus, your area is your strategies, your involvement to improve what is that data sharing with us. Well, that's, that's what we want from every leader in California to be doing this. And so the Cal APA gives us a kind of an understanding. They get an understanding about where they are. Do they understand that? Do they understand the level of their skills and abilities? So I, I think that, that, that that's a really important piece for us to keep about 
why we need to have the, the APA. We need to know that leaders know this is what's expected of them to do an educational leader. You know, I was thinking about the, you know, when it talks about have our candidates benefited from this? Yes, they have in so many ways because they're getting a clear picture that when I go into leadership in California, this is what I'm, this is what I need to do. This is what I work with. You know, the cycle two, when it talks about the issue about looking at a community of practices and working together as a team in order to, to deal with the issues and the continuous learning that needs to happen, improvement at a school site, that's what the, we got to have that happening at all of our schools. And so understanding their level and their involvement. So as I, I kind of looked at this and I, you know, when I was asked to, to come and speak, I, I am very, very strong around the issue about that we need to do performance assessment because part of it is we need to have understand that our leaders that are going in, this is what's expected of them. And then the, 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 the TPA helps us so much in giving them an understanding about where their level and their performance abilities are in doing what's being asked of them and leaders. And it's just been exciting. So um, I'm a strong a strong supporter. Program-wise, it's created this issue about we as a program have to look at what are we doing to make sure they have those skills, those knowledge to do what's being asked on the Cal APA. So um, it's great. Thanks. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, about my experience as a Cal APA candidate. I worked on the Cal APA this year uh, to earn my preliminary administrative credential through the Sacramento County Office of Education. I want to acknowledge Dr. Winlop as one of my instructors and the SCOE program as a whole for setting up the support and the infrastructure for uh, helping me with the Cal APA. And I'm going to give you an example of uh, the positive impact that working on the Cal APA had on me. Um, I teach high school math um, at a school in the Sacramento area, and school that ended in May, and over the summer we had a week of uh, summer planning. And I, as a department lead of the math department, was tasked with setting up an agenda, facilitating meetings, and uh, forging a collective vision for what that work could look like over the summer. And I can tell you that I did that work with confidence because I had done uh, three of the Cal APAs, which prepared me for doing everything from asking input from teachers about what should the agenda look like to analyzing the equity gaps at my school site. And it may seem trivial to ask teachers, hey, what should we do for our agenda for the summer planning? But that's a mindset shift for me and the department I work at, where agendas are set up in vacuum and teachers come in the room and they're like, okay, I guess this is what we're doing. But this was a change because I learned through the SCOE program, Dr. Winlock, and the Cal APA, that some of that work needs to be done collectively, as opposed to one person just setting up a vision and saying everybody else is going to follow along. So that was a mindset shift. That helped me as a teacher and as a leader to figure out what sort of leader I want to be. Um, I also want to say that the Cal APA um, gave me the tools to lead with confidence and be aware of my own identity as a teacher and my own bias, and also engage in improvement through cycle of inquiry and realize that the work is continuous and never ending. Um, it was a daunting task, I, I still would admit that, and uh, I think um, part of what helped was the cohort model through the Sacramento County Office of Education because I learned to work with teachers like myself and collaborate and figure out what sort of leaders do we want to be by looking at each other's Cal APAs and figuring out these are the equity gaps that exist in my school site. What are we doing about it? And learning from other people in terms of what are they doing about it. So that was my experience. And um, in summary, really, the Cal APA was a vehicle of reflection. It made me more reflective as a teacher. It made me more reflective as a future potential leader. And um, I can continue to use that work in my classroom as well as conference rooms like, like this one. So thank you. You know, if I could just add one of the things, thank you so much for your uh, response back. To, but the, the issue is that we deal with a lot of what it, what it newly appointed administrators, what do they need to do? What do they need to do the job? You're just hearing 
he could start tomorrow. So please feel, you know, comfortable and hiring him, getting him involved because he's been excellent. But he, he's ready to start in leadership of education. That's another benefit of the Cal APA. Well, just I want to thank you all for being with us today, and I will turn it back to uh, Dr. Martinez to move us forward yeah. into questions. Thank you. Just a, a quick question. Will you guys be able to stick around for a little bit longer? Um, and, and Mary, we thought we'd open up for public comment first and then. All right, so we're going to go ahead and open up to public comment, as I believe we have a few, and, um, and then we'll come back to the commissioners for questions and answers with this um, really wonderful panel to be able to ask their questions. So um, recording secretary, do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. We'll start with the online public comments. Marisol Ruiz, please unmute your microphone and share your comment. So hello, everyone. I am a professor at Cal, um, Cal Poly Humboldt. And I am I'm kind of disheartened that it was all one sided, you know, pro TPA. We just did a survey of 224 candidates, 90%, 201 do not wa want to eliminate this exam. And the reason that they give is very clear, right? One, it, as some of you have mentioned, the amount of stress. First, you're dealing with students that came back from the pandemic. They have a lot of social emotional. So there, oh, there is a contradiction between this framework. I, I hope that I get the same amount that everybody else did because everyone got a lot of amount and there's not the other perspective. And the other perspective is that this framework is social emotional. I keep on getting beeped and I can't finish my thought process, but the framework is flawed. UDL, social emotional learning, all of this that happened after the pandemic that our students are having to deal with. And, um, and what about UDL or social emotional learning for our candidates? The other thing that happened um, and through the surveys is also this cultural taxation also for our teachers. Some of our teachers are the only Latinos in the whole school. And that created an impact having to do ed TPA, this coming back from the pandemic and um, having to attend to the needs of students of color as the only person of color in that school. It's, it's the same thing that happened to indigenous folks. I don't see how a TPA, teacher performance assessment can uh, give us authentic learning in the schools or what our students need because our students are in the field trying to deal with so, so much, so, so much. And I, and even before I, I, I saw, told, we're going to need you to wrap up your comments here at two minutes and the time limit was for one. Yes. TPAs are not based on critical pedagogies and we do not need them in order for us to, to be a collective and working together to make the best learning experience for our candidates and for our student K through 12 students. We do not need them. We could do that ourselves as right, th experts thank you. in our field. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and my apologies, folks, for not reminding public comment is limited to one minute, whereas our panelists each had two minutes. So um, recording secretary, can we go to our next public comment? And, and as a reminder, if you can't see the clock, the first warning is that you have 20 seconds left. And the second warning is that you have five seconds left. Zoe Bartholomew, please unmute your microphone and share your comment. Yes, I just wanted to point out that it's I'm happy to see that this is happening um, for our ed specialist candidates. And I just want to push the group today to think about really this TPA is designed to really push the efforts of really seeing if our candidates can teach our students. And I think we're focused a little bit too much on the students themselves that they are going to be teaching, but we need to look at our efforts that we've been pushing around quality education, which starts with our candidates. And so for me, who's been in this field 
for over 20 years on the specialist side. I really think it's exciting to see that we have created this only assessment tool that really pushes the level of looking at performance of our actual candidates. And so I'm in full support of us moving this initiative forward. Thank you. Thank you. Margarita Berta Avila, please unmute your microphone and share your comment. Good morning. My name is Margarita Berta Avila. I'm a professor of education at Sacramento State, as well representing the Teacher Ed Caucus for the California Faculty Association, which represents over 29,000 faculty. And we're here today um, in um, really asking for the CTC to reconsider the use of the TPA. As an instrument, the research is clear more now than ever that high stakes assessments like the EdTPA do not improve education for students and for teachers and have already proven to widen inequities. There's four areas of concern in particular uh, with respect to one, design, validity, and reliability. Second area of concern is the impact of TPAs on program curriculum and candidate performance. The third area of concern is the barriers of to diversity, as well as the fourth concern, the impact on teacher shortage. And so what we're asking is for the California teacher education programs um, to reflect on uh, already the amount of uh, requirements that are embedded that do not need a high stakes decision making, such as the EdTPA. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nick Henning, please unmute your microphone and share your comment. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Nick Henning, and I'm a professor of secondary education at Cal State Fullerton. I'm here to represent the members of the Teacher Education Caucus and K-12 Public Education Working Group of the California Faculty Association. And we demand an immediate and permanent end to the use of high-stakes consequential teacher performance assessments in all their forms. Such tests have not, have not been proven to produce a higher quality teaching force. They are not valid and reliable in predicting teacher quality, but they do disproportionately filter out students of color and place unnecessary stress and burdens on our candidates. The cost, stress, time, and demoralization related to high stake standardized credentialing tests that are severely problematic with regard to validity, reliability, fairness, and bias has been documented, researched, and shared multiple times with this commission, the governor's office, and the state legislature for many years now. I myself have been involved in the piloting and implementation of the CalTPA, the PACT, and the EdTPA for the almost last two decades. And the perspectives presented on this panel do not match the experience of my hundreds of students or that of my teacher ed colleagues. In fact, the things that they are citing as strengths of the TPAs are things we already practice and assess as accredited teacher education programs in California. So we urge you to strongly recommend that this, is, this mandate is lifted. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is from the um, audience, uh, Ursula Estrada Ravelas. Hello, good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Dr. Ursula Estrada Rivelas, and I'm with Riverside County Office of Education, where I serve as the executive director. I'm also a former member of the Cal APA design team, as well as the lead uh, assessor for Cycle One. And so, just wanted to take a couple minutes to share with you that. When we designed the Cal APA, of course, we were looking to align to the capes and the capsules, but beyond that, we were really looking to create an assessment that suited the California context. And so with that, I'll speak a little bit to cycle one. Um, in conversations with my program director, who's phenomenal, Dr. Kim Law, um, she is all about equity. And she has used cycle one as a leverage point with her students to ensure that they're well prepared to be able to conduct an equity gap analysis, not only to in conduct an equity gap analysis, but also to come up with a suitable solution for that particular problem of practice. So with that, we're in support of uh, Cal APA. Thank you. Next is Adam Ibrahim.
Good morning, Chair Sloan, Commissioners, and Executive Director Sandy. Uh, my name is Adam Ibrahim. I am a TPA survivor uh, and staff with the California Teachers Association. Um, we continue to be concerned about the effects of EdTPA and CalTPA on teacher preparation in California. Uh, we would like to share some questions we're considering and pose them for you here today. Whose voices is the Commission choosing to listen to? And beyond the anecdotal testimony, why aren't we systematically gathering input from our teacher candidates to, to address disproportional outcomes and drive ongoing improvement of the TPA? How might we incentivize more innovation in the development of teacher performance assessments like FAST and Fresno to generate models that pay formative dividends and integrate more meaningfully with teacher preparation programs? You heard from Dr. Peck, what caused states like Washington, New York, Georgia, Wisconsin, and soon New Jersey to move away from the TPA? And how might, might we be proactive about addressing these issues in California so we are not left with a vacuum? We look forward to working with the Commission on an eyes wide open approach to help connect perspectives and experiences for, for, of our members, your end users, to this important discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Recording Secretary, are there any other public comments? There are no additional public comments. Okay, I'll just give it a moment. Okay, the public comment period is, is now closed and um, we will move forward with additional questions that commissioners may have or any comments and thank our panel for sticking with us um, in case we wanna ask you guys questions directly. So um, the commissioners, questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner De La Torre. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a question about what, uh, I appreciate all of the anecdotal comments and panelists and uh, public comments as well, but I would like to see some of the data uh, around the EdTPAs because if it's, the data wouldn't lie, we would see the numbers if it is effective, if it does show improvement of teacher performance, or if it doesn't. So if we could see that objectively, I'm wondering if we have any of that data available. Amy or someone else from the staff? Okay. <laughs> Executive Director Sandy, do you want to add anything? Okay, all right. Um, thank you for the question. Other questions from commissioners or comments? Okay, Commissioner um, Klatt and then Commissioner Francois. Um, I just want to thank um, staff and all of our panelists and all the speakers and letter writers um, for taking the time to set up this item. Um, I know we had a very full plate, but I found this discussion um, just so engaging and so important. Um, we were talking about TPAs, but I think these discussions about assessment transcend the TPA. And really, I, I was scrambling to take notes because I think so much of the conversation informs just how I, um, I create assessments in my own classroom and what I do with those assessments. So this conversation, I think, was, I wish we were having the same level of conversation about all of our assessments throughout our state with both our teachers and our students. Um, I think it reminds me in many ways, I was very involved as probably many of you were with the Casey when we had the Casey. And when Dr. Peck was, was discussing his reaction, I had that same reaction as an English teacher to my students who suddenly had to take this Casey. Um, and the, I subsequently worked with CDE, um, left the classroom for a few years to work on the Casey at the state level. And while I had many issues and concerns about that examination, it did, as I think Dr. Peck talked about it, it made some invisible things visible. And programs high schools had to address, they, they were required and forced, some of them I think for the first time, to address who was not doing well on the Casey, who wasn't passing it, and have those very difficult and very, like, those were, it was a daunting task to look at who's not passing this test and what can we do to support them. So while I, I 
saw the letters and I heard from the public that I absolutely think we, we need to ask these questions and they're important. Is this assessment doing what we want it to do? But while we eliminated Casey, I, I fear that that made some of those students invisible again. And I would hate to see that happen here. So as much as I think we have work to do, and I again, I appreciate the people who, who wrote letters and spoke. Um, to me, having those conversations about how we can make the assessment better um, is a direction I would like to move in rather than us just eliminating and then not knowing um, what's going on there. Um, so again, I just appreciate everyone who took the time today. This was, I thought, such um, an invigorating discussion to have. So, so thank you all. Thank you, Commissioner Collette. Uh, Commissioner Francois? I too want to thank everyone who presented today, um, particularly our on the ground panelists, as I like to call them. Um, I have been involved in this TPA world since SB 2042, both as a teacher educator um, and later as the director of teacher education. And I can tell you that this landscape has been messy and hard and um, we've been challenged left, right, sideways. and. You know, I want to start by saying, I, in the field, I do not believe there's any question about what we ask candidates to do being valuable. And I, you know, I want to recognize Amy Rising for staying the course and really listening when we talked about how does equity show up in these TPAs? And if it doesn't show up, and if it's not explicit, we ought not be doing it. Um, and Amy, you and your team really listened to that. You know, I can say this publicly, I don't think we've gone far enough, but we've made a lot of, we've, we've, we've made a lot of gain in the last, um, gosh, decade or so. So having said that, I also wanna say that I appreciated Linda's historical perspective because it's important that we remind ourselves of why this came into being in the first place, and I think Executive Director Sandy, you used the words, lack of confidence and inconsistent unevenness among teacher preparation programs. I will attest to that. And I think EdTPA has in some way influenced us in teacher preparation to be more consistent, to have more collaborative conversations with one another, both, both internally but across program um, within our segments in particular. But I think there's a lot of collaboration that happened across um, the various segments. <clears throat> Two of the things that were said today that really stuck with me. Oh, before I move to that, I also want to acknowledge um, what, doc, what Dr. Sales from Pepperdine said, because I think that what he described um, is the best of what is possible as a result of the, the TPA. Um, I, I don't think that we are quite there yet. But he has articulated a vision of what could be if we stay the course on what we ask candidates to do. So my critique of the TPA is not what we ask candidates to do. It is <clears throat> how we implement the TPA, the effects on curriculum and programs, the negative effects of, on curriculum and programs. I think Cap talked about the potential, um, but we didn't talk about the negative as much, as well as the effects it has on candidates because it's such a high stakes test. I would say that we would be able to implement, I mean, the embedded nature of the TPAs is what makes it really powerful for program improvement, for instructional purposes, and for candidates to really be able to reflect more deeply um, about their practice. The high stakes nature of it, I think, creates emotional and mental barriers for some of our candidates to do that, particularly our candidates of color, as mm -hmm. Commissioner Davis mentioned, who are already, who some already have challenges, related challenges going into, in our case, graduate school. Um, and the expectations that we place on them in moving the needle on equity, diversity, and inclusion in schools, even as student teachers, as novice teachers. Um, 
So I think that we need to stay focused on the the, the um, intention that Cap put forward to us around TPA demonstrating the extent to which candidates take up what they learned in, in teacher education or leadership preparation. I don't know that you need a high stakes test to do that. I do think that you need to have the kinds of dimensions of practice that are reflected in the TPA. But I, I grapple with the need for program improvement, the need for us to measure um, how folks take, take this up the burden in both emotional and mental burden of high stakes testing on our, um, on our candidates. And I wonder if the main, major question I take away is, you know, how do you know that you've changed the culture enough to ensure that there's consistency and cohesion across teacher preparation? I think that the TPA helped us to be more cohesive, gave the public more confidence in what was happening in teacher and administrative preparation. And is it possible that we have changed the culture enough that we can remove the high stakes nature of it, embed it back into programs where there is localized scoring to help with program improvement and, um, and uh, in improving instruction? Because CAP reminded us that it, the TPA is best used as a learning tool. I, I question whether or not what comes first when things are high stakes. Is it the learning or is it the compliance and making sure that it gets done? And so um, I don't really have an end to, the, to that, those comments, um, but I do wanna say two last things. What the representative CTA brought forward about the voices of teacher candidates and how we are listening to them, I think is really important. Um, and recent program um, completers. And then I would ask the staff, because um, Commissioner De La Torre brought up something really important, that we should always be looking at the data to confirm our best hunches. And that's what we do around this table. Our best hunches based on the data and both based on voices from the field. Um, and so when we have these kinds of items that we know are being discussed in the field, they are high stakes, they are in many ways contentious, I would ask that the staff revisit and summarize the data for us because to ask us to remember what was presented in February given all the activity in the field feels very dissatisfying to me. Um, so that's just kind of a pr process check and thank you for allowing me to comment. I have no suggestions or recommendations, um, but I hope y'all are feeling it. It's very comprehensive, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Davis, then Commissioner Heredia. Um, thank you. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanted to uh, say uh, thank you, um, uh, Commissioner Francois, because very eloquently spoken, and I appreciate that endorsement. Uh, it, Dr. Sales started, um, his presentation by saying, I, and I gra grabbed a piece of what he said, and it's just a piece of a sentence, and he said, from non-marginalized communities. And I think that that's an important phrase that we should consider when we're having this discussion. Um, that at, at, I work with Stanford um, and they're um, in, at the MBRC with the National Board Program, and one of the important pieces of my work, I, I think is my, my, my work, um, is helping people see their implicit bias, so, you know, especially in their writing. Uh, in a self-reflective process, it's very, very difficult for us to either see or acknowledge that on occasion. And sometimes it takes an outsider to help point that out to you. Not rub it in your face, but just point it out to you. And with that said, I'd like to see an extension of what, do, uh, what um, Commissioner Francois said about like kind of what are we measuring with um, you know the with the TPAs we're measuring performance I get that we have data that reflects either success or non-success of any testing instrument but the byproducts that we 
have skirted around in this discussion about how BIPOC folks are affected or disenfranchised by these measure, measures, um, I think is worth looking at. And I should say, not just worth looking at, should be at the forefront of whatever discussion we have about either continuing with this or not continuing with this and, and just seeing with any TPA how that looks. And we can look at California data, we can look at national data, but look at data in general because it seems like from the discussion that I'm hearing from our esteemed panelists and our speakers um, here via Zoom um, that our panelists keep talking about how their their programs have gotten better, but I I'm I I'm hearing sort of like a subtext, and this is not to be offensive to anyone, but I'm hearing that on the backs of people of color who have come through the program who have failed, that we have then improved after we've noticed that we've failed whole communities of people. And that's what I'm hearing, but that's not necessarily what's being stated, but it is kind of a subtext because we're talking about, for example, in Fresno, where we had a slew of teacher candidates who, uh, in a special ed program, who were given TPAs that didn't necessarily align with the credential program, that they failed. So they didn't pass a TPA. Did they persist? Did they continue in the program? Or did, you know, that? but I don't know that we have data to, to substantiate their persistence or not, right? So my point in this is, if we see the failures of the assessment, if we see the deficits, we should be looking at that piece and trying to figure out, so how do we tighten this up? How do we make this stronger or better? So the efficacy of the, 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 the TPA, is it questioned as much as it's being questioned today by the community, uh, by our, um, by some of the commissioners, by, by some folks out in the audience today? I really think that we're on the crux of doing something great. And if we can just include everybody at the table in the discussion and those folks who have been disparaged by this process, how do we make that not happen again, in other words? And one of, one of the other things I wanted to know, um, and, and, and this probably is in the data that Amy has, um, about the passing rate at the Cal APA level, because that's something I never hear about. I never hear about administrators failing the the the, the, the TPAs that are there for them, or the the APAs, I should say, for them. Um, but also, just keeping that in mind that if we have folks that are not being successful, who are they and why? And I don't think that that's something that we should say oh, by the way, yeah, I guess there are some people that are disenfranchised, but here's the great thing about our program, because that's not the way that we are supposed to be operating as educators in California. We're supposed to be acknowledging everyone and being inclusive of everyone and not saying, well, you know, those folks didn't pass or whatever. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Um, We'll just, um, unless there's any comments by, oh, um, Commissioner Redia? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know, Amy, did I see you reach for your microphone about the APA question? <laughs> so that is a great question. And we do have um, an item coming up in August where we will bring you the Cal APA data. But I can tell you uh, off the cuff that at this time, we have pretty much 100% pass rate across the th three cycles mostly due to the fact that we uh, put in place, the commissioner put in place uh, very supportive passing rates so that programs could embed the assessment in their programs, work towards understanding the cycles, support their faculty in learning the rubrics, and support their candidates. And we'll be coming back to you in August to talk about relooking at the passing standard and the standard error of measure that was applied uh, several years back, four years ago and uh, looking at new data. We now have over 4,000 candidates that have taken it, and we just did a standard setting study a month ago. We'll be bringing all of that forward to you in August for your consideration. Um, but uh, at this time, uh, 
we have a hundred percent pass rate across the board. Thank you, Amy, and we look forward to August. And thank you for raising that, um, Commissioner. Oh, did you want to comment, Executive Directors? I, I I just wanted to appreciate that, and and some of the comments that Linda uh, Darling Hammond left us with this morning about. I mean, if a hundred percent of the people are passing the assessment, that's a good thing. You could consider that a good thing, I, and depending on where you set the passing standard. And, and what's good about it, what could be good about it, if, if things are working optimally, that means that you've prepared this community well and they've been able to demonstrate their performance on, on the assessment. And we have had pretty high pass rates, really, uh, on our performance assessments, in part because the standard, the passing standard that, that you set at this table, uh, we have used um, instruments like a standard error of measure which is a statistical analysis you can apply to a score uh, to ensure that you're not having a negative impact on a population, which has been your, your practice for decades now, so that you uh, are giving candidates the opportunity to learn that both Cap and Linda spoke to this morning, uh, and making sure programs are not um, undermining candidates by not preparing them to do this. So there, there are assets and deficits to this system, to the systems we've been putting in place. I would say that what California has undertaken with performance assessment is one of the hardest things a licensing board can do. It is far easier to administer a CBEST <laughs> than to do this, <laughs> okay? And a CBEST gives you static data and, and there's a lot of, wow, okay, I guess we've got to do better because, you know, uh, this is not that. This is, we are, we have put so many important eggs in this basket, which is let's get some common language. Thank you, Cap, for reminding us of that. Some common language around performance and what, what effective performance looks like. Let's talk about that and get collective about that and understanding what it is. But let's not be biased about that. Very important. Let's not bring any particular cultural bias to what effective means. That's something we struggle with every single year. And I know the performance assessment team uh, works on that every single year. They are examining and, and scrubbing the data we get after every assessment uh, to see how is this instrument performing and who is performing and who is not performing and we've got an accreditation system that is learning how to take those data back to programs and say, why is it that X percent of your candidates and particularly some of your BIPOC candidates are not performing well? How can, you know, what, where are they not performing in relation to standards and how can we improve on that? That's how you make this continuous improvement loop happen. So we have a system that does get better every year based on the data and, and, you know, and the data is shedding light on things that we need to be critically aware of. And if we're, I, from, from our perspective, our theory of action is, if we're not aware of it, then nobody will see it. And inequities will continue to be perpetuated, but nobody's looking. So I just wanted to, I, I, I put that on the table. I can't remember what you said that I, but maybe put that on the table. I couldn't stop myself. So forgive me, Commissioner Davis. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Commissioner Heredia. It's on there, all right. So um, I appreciate this study session. Um, I, I think that there is a lot to be learned and um, it's a pre I, I appreciate hearing from everybody in the field and um, even my former colleague, <laughs> um, you know, about, about this. I remember 2042. I remember like, oh my God, what are we gonna have to do next? And, and just the angst of that, of implementing it. And um, glad for another colleague um, said, oh, I love this stuff. So I'll, I'll start, I'll get it off the ground for us um, in our college. Um, but I do remember that. And I do remember the whole thing about, you know, the, the idea of assessment and why do we have to do this? And, and I was probably one of those that really struggled and really thought, oh gosh, how long can I keep it at bay? Um, but um, for the reasons that we need assessment um, that have been explained today, I, I finally um, came to my senses about, about, you know, making sure that we had some common measures within the college to, to understand what we were doing. 
But I do want to go back to the comments of, um, that were made by the representative from CTA and also the representative um, who, who called in from, um, uh, from Sac State, um, that we have to remember whose voices, who determines um, what is knowledge and um, whose voices do we list, you know, whose voices are at the table. And I'm, I'm really, con you know, really want us to be very cognizant of that um, because um, there are a lot of candidates who don't, who don't pass. And, um, and, you know, we have to counsel them out of teaching sometimes, not only just for, just for the assessment, but also that, you know, their performance in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, but so I, I am, I am concerned about the voices at the table. Um, com, you know, Commissioner um, Francois, um, all of your comments, I'm not gonna, you know, I, many of those that you shared, um, I share those also. Uh, many of the questions that you were raised and, and even um, Commissioner Clatt, I think you started off us thinking about the assessment, um, you know, and questions about it. Um, but I do believe that we, do, we need assessments. I'm not, I'm not the anti-assessment um, person. But I do think, you know, wonder about do we need a, a test? Do we need a high stakes test? Do Because uh, I have seen over the years, I've seen what happens to the candidates. I almost think that sometimes candidates go into teaching focused on the test as opposed to really focus on, on teaching. It's like, what do they want me to do? And it's like they check off the boxes instead of really you know, um, taking themselves through the journey of learning to teach through a teacher education program. And that's of a, of a concern for me because you, you want them to love teaching. You don't want them to think like, it's at the end I get my assessment results and, um, and they focus, that's the sole focus. So again, I, um, you know, the, the idea of who doesn't pass, why they're not passing, but I also um, am very aware that you know some some universities um, have the infrastructure to support candidates to pass, and others don't. I happen to be one of those people who went into a teacher education program that was so designed um, to make you to help you succeed. And uh, whether you know, 50% of my um, professors were um, you know professors of color. I I I, I just uh, it was just a unique experience. And um, that also helped me get through through a program because I went in I went in with the expectations of I can do this, you know, and the, and, they, and the expectations were high, but I already felt like I was in a, in a setting where where the expectations were you will do this, we will help you, the support will be there. So I think we need to look at it, and if that's not possible, you know, what, who are the pe teachers in the field? I struggled to find teachers in the field, um, you know, and, and those of us who didn't have to go through, the, through this assessment. So, I mean, there's many of them out there. Um, you know, I do find, I did struggle finding teachers in the field that really understood, like, what is it that I'm really supposed to do? Because their teaching experiences were so different and, and the um, expectations were so different. So, uh, you know, it's the infrastructure, it's some, of the, some of the things that we can't get into, that's not our, our purview of getting into the weeds sometimes, you know, on, on some things. Um, but I think what we can do as a commission is we couldn't, we can offer um, recommendations or suggestions of what needs to be, um, you know, what needs to happen in a, in a setting, in an entity that to support um, students. Um, and not only that, but, um, you know, just, um, I, I'm, you know, I'm with the, I'm, I, I would support the idea of looking at, do we need a test? Can we just make sure that all of these are somehow, there's accountability within coursework? And is and can they and can they demonstrate it? Is there some way that we can look at that? So, um, I just want to thank um, my commissioners, who, the fellow commissioners, who for your comments because all of your comments um, always raises more questions for me, and um, you know I just I think it just helps for me further um, think about um, it's more deeply about um, our role here. So thank you and thank you to the presenters today too for taking your time and coming here and for the staff. I, I can only imagine the number of hours that um, Amy and her and her staff have spent at the table on this, so thank you. Okay, we have Commissioner Rodriguez and then Chair Sloan and then Commissioner De La Torre.
There it is. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, Liaison Rodriguez. I want to uh, thank everybody, all our panelists and everybody who called in, and the CTC staff for uh, putting together this study session. I feel like this is our performance assessment. Um, you know, in so many ways, right? Because we're looking at a lot of different factors, opening the, vo uh, the floor for so many voices, and, um, you know, the, the final performance of, you know, the, the work that we're doing together, um, collaborating, and uh, which is an operative word, you know, and I think that collaboration um, and opening doors to our classroom uh, is, is something that we're still not doing 100% in our schools. Um, uh, but I do want to say, you know, with the, one of the issues that I have had uh, even before I came into the profession, because I'm a career changer, is the low status that the teaching profession has. And at the core of that low status is this myth um, and the lie that anybody can teach because that is not true. Not everybody can teach. And I, I know as a National Board Certified Teacher that I am on par with doctors, with engineers, with lawyers in my efforts to diagnose my students. I am a constant diagnostician. I learned that because I had a high quality uh, teacher education program. And I also learned that when uh, not having the common language in a, in, a, in a staff room, that teachers can often resort to criticisms that are very unfair um, and, and that are final, right? For example, oh, the kids are lazy, their parents don't care, et cetera, et cetera. And as a diagnostician, as somebody who's trained to get to know my students, to meet them where they are, um, I would say that the opposite is true. And when I talk to other National Board Certified Teachers uh, or other teachers who have gone through EdTPA, we have a common language. And, uh, and I'm very proud of that because I do consider the work that I do as important as an attorney, as important as a doctor, as important as a pilot um, who has you know, the lives of hundreds of people at their hand every time. I have hundreds of students and their lives and their minds. I have the privilege of accessing young minds, and I want all of the teachers on my school site in California and in this country to be as equally prepared as I am. Um, so, you know, with regard to high stakes testing, other professions have, you know, uh, if you don't pass the bar, you don't practice law, right? If you don't pass um, the doctor thing, um, you don't doctor, and so, um, you know, the, yeah, the medical, medical boards, like national boards, and so anyway, um, you know, there, we, we do have to have, for our profession, as, as a spokesperson uh, for a profession, uh, you know, by teachers, for teachers, and educators, um, I think it's so important that, uh, there is a measurement for, um, you know, and, and an entry. And to meet the needs of uh, people who struggle, whether it's with the teacher prep courses or providing the proper coaching uh, for teachers who are marginalized, right, uh, or, um, teachers of color, how are we supporting them um, so that they, uh, you know, can, can uh, beat some of those... Um, uh, walls, right? Beat down those walls that might uh, provide a barrier to access. So, um, and I'll close with uh, Commissioner De La Torre when we worked on the uh, leadership uh, national board. I don't know if you remember the jokes around the table, um, and I mentioned this when we were uh, working on the APA, um, that it had a lamentable um, acronym, N-B-C-E-L, n And so we used to <laughs> National Board Certified uh, for Educational Leaders, right? And we used to go, what a lament lamentable acronym, but thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair Sloan and then Commissioner De La Troy. 
Commissioners, this was our opportunity to learn more about the performance assessments, especially for those um, who haven't been involved in them for most of their career, like some of us, and, and to bring up the questions that have been brought up. And these are the right questions that we're asking as we're moving forward in our work here. Three things that have uh, really come up around our work uh, from my perspective. One is, is things that are around the tool itself, the assessment tool itself. How is it designed? Um, who determines what the knowledge is that is put in the tool? Um, many things that you all mentioned. These are things we have to keep track of as we're moving forward with this work. The second thing that I was going to bring up was um, our profession. And thank you, Liaison Rodriguez, for beating me to the there is something that's quite critical about ensuring that our profession, uh, where we are now and where we need to go, is seen as a profession like all other professions. And unless we have a way of ensuring the public that the teachers who are certified by the state of California are ready to teach, and there are multiple ways we do that, but other professions do that with exams where their candidates do need to demonstrate that they are ready to go. Um, we can continue to grow in how we require our candidates to demonstrate that they're ready to teach, and there are lots of ways that we can continue to grow around that. The final and most important thing, I think, in my perspective to talk about is implementation of the tool. And there have been a, a lot of work and, and things that we have said here today. Um, Dr. Heredia said all uh, her institution was designed so students could be to succeed. All of our institutions have to be designed so students can succeed. And this is not to say that um, we as a policy body, uh, we can think about that. But if we think about, remember the RICA, and well, we can all remember, we're still working with still the here. RICA. Still here. But remember the student testimony of all of the students who had gone through teacher preparation programs and they could not earn their certification because they could not pass the RICA. One of the big problems in my perspective on the RICA is programs were not held responsible. Candidates could go through the entire preparation program and, and presumably uh, they were either not prepared to teach reading or they were not prepared to understand the ways in which they needed to demonstrate how they teach reading. And the RICA was not about demonstrating how they teach reading. And that's why we're moving towards a performance assessment where it is now we want to ensure that you have the opportunity to demonstrate that you can read. And you need to learn how to teach reading in your program. And all of your faculty need to know how to do that. One of the things that Dr. Peck brought up, and I can say from 22 years in a research intensive institution, the way I earned my tenure was uh, to meet the particular criteria for what it was that I needed to do. And it's a very individualistic criteria. <coughs> it didn't involve the fact that um, a big part of my work was bringing our faculty together to look at uh, the data. It wasn't all of the hours that I spent looking at student data with all of my colleagues and figuring out how we were going to redesign our courses and redesign our work in order to ensure that we were preparing the best teachers. It was um, my course evaluations, it was my research publications, and our institutions need to change the way we conduct our reward structures, particularly if we are going to be supporting some of the most important things that we could ever support, and that's the professionalized education pieces that we do in our institutions. And it requires resources, uh, because the fact is, um, our, our instructors are hired to teach X number of courses often, that's how they're paid. Uh, many times, I can say in the UC system, our faculty aren't paid to do all of the work that it does to look at data and get better in their practice in a collaborative kind of way. That has to change.
And I'm not sure what we can do about it here, but it has, it has been something that we have thought about for a while. So um, I will say finally, we do know that the candidate success on the performance assessment, just like their success as teachers in a classroom, does have a lot to do with how they were prepared, what kinds of supports they got, what kinds of feedback they got. We know there is a difference between candidates who need to start their career as interns and begin as a teacher of record with 120 hours of coursework in the summer, and they're, they're in the classroom with kids trying to get as much as they possibly can to learn how to do what they need to do for those kids in that moment versus a candidate who is in um, uh, an integrated undergraduate program or a residency program or another post-baccalaureate program where they have constant supports from a mentor teacher, from university supervisors, from county education office people from uh, all of that over uh, at least a year of learning how to teach. There's a big difference. And we know that when you have that kind of support going into the profession, you stay longer. We have a lot of research that now is pointing to the fact that in California, the candidates who started out their teaching career on waivers or in intern programs leave the profession at a far faster rate than those who had the opportunity to learn how to teach before they became the uh, teacher record. And the real travesty behind this is that there are more teachers of color in the pathways, the intern and starting out with waivers than the other pathways. And this is a problem and it intersects with what we are talking about here today. So these are all things that we need to keep in mind as we are moving forward with this work. Finally, Dr. Simmons, I mean, David Simmons, you brought up, you doctor if you wish, you brought up, uh, you're that smart. I don't have a You brought up one of the most important things that we, I think, grapple with as a pol policy body, and that has to do with centralized scoring versus local scoring. And um, I think we can continue to explore the ways in which we can move forward with this work. Um, because that's critically important. Once we moved to centralized scoring, we had far more inter-rater reliability amongst our scores, but we took away a lot of the opportunity to faculty to really look at exactly what their candidates are doing. And I can say, finally, as a faculty member who would teach candidates um, about particular things. I, would, I was focused on uh, assessment and, and a lot of um, now socio-emotional learning and trauma, et cetera. I didn't get the opportunities to go into their classrooms very much and see what they were doing. So it was when I could sit down with my colleagues and look at their video and look at their lesson plans and look at the ways in which they were or were not doing what I hoped they would do. Um, that's that's when we learned and we got better and we could support our candidates better. But we as a program need to be held accountable for doing that. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner De La Torre and then Commissioner Simmons. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I appreciate um, all of my colleagues and all the comments and uh, just three things that I want to add and, and reiterate one thing is that the data that I specifically requested um, is not the data that we received in February, although I appreciate that data as well. It's very comprehensive. But I was more asking about what is the impact that the ed TPA has on improved student learning. So is there evidence that supports that the ed TPA actually helps teachers become better for student increased student learning? And I'm not, I'm not opposed to high stakes assessments or I love formative assessments, which I see that the TPAs are. We believe in performance assessments for our students for the same reasons. Um, as a National Board Certified Teacher, that is a high, very high stakes assessment, but it's also a formative assessment. And I know that the impact it had in my teaching, um, and I am a diagnostician as well, and I agree. I can assess and prescribe, that's what I learned. We assess and we prescribe. Every student, every moment, every daily. And so I really believe in that, and it made me a better teacher. Um, but. For the National Board Certification, we do have the Harvard SDP study that specifically shows how the going through the National Board and becoming board certified actually does make you a better teacher. 
and we have hard data that shows that this does help student learning. And so the data that I was requesting is I don't see any data in the February report that shows how the ed TPAs actually help student learning. And I think that if we had that data, it would help our colleagues to see how this actually is beneficial. And if it doesn't show that it has that data, then maybe we should pursue different options. So I'm very interested to learn what data is there that supports that ed TPAs do result in improved learning for students. So, thank you. That is such an important question. Can I just jump in on that? Such an important question you're asking, and it has been, it's a, I think we call that a study of consequential validity of, of our instruments, That's and, and those are elusive. I know that there has been research on the impact of PACT, which was the precursor to EdTPA, uh, that demonstrated some positive impact on, on student learning. But we, it's, it's very challenging research uh, to do, to look at how, you know, how a teacher did on a performance assessment in preparation against how their students are performing. Is, it's a very challenging line to draw. And I'm going to say that while I'm sitting next to one of the preeminent researchers who could probably speak more clearly to that. But it's not an unimportant question that you're asking. It's a little outside the scope of the CTC at this time to do, but I think it's a really important question to keep pursuing, which is how, what does, how do you understand the improvement of a teacher's performance based on how they perform on a TPA? Um, we, we don't have great research on this, although if Cap Peck is still on the line, and I'm not sure he is. He's not here. Okay, he had to leave. So his, I commend to your reading his, his, uh, his review of the research literature, and it's linked in your agenda insert for this item, uh, because he does dig in on some of these, these uh, challenging issues around TPA and understanding it. But I would say that, well, I, I think I'm just going to stop it right there, because I, I know we've got a big agenda that we still need to get to, but very important question and one we are all profoundly interested in. Thank you. Um, Commissioner <coughs> Simmons and uh, Commissioner Francois. Okay, I go back to Dr. Peck and the comment about it being democratic, attentive, concrete, real, and personal. It really makes me think of what we do in our classrooms around the whole PLC things and how that some schools I've worked with, their PLC is like PLC light, we call it. And then in other schools, they actually like do it. And I, I have found that state data is often not the best data that is actionable through that kind of professional learning community. So I'm wondering, is there a way that we can encourage, and I, and I know that it's the continuous improvement common standard is the worst one to write to. When I ran teacher prep programs, I hated that common standard. But I wonder if that's really where we're landing as maybe the kind of disconnect that we have. But I, so that's one thing. And then I also had a question for Fresno. Did you want me to respond? So I, I can, so one thing, um, Commissioner Simmons is to know that for the ed TPA and for the Cal TPA, and I'm sure this is also true for FAST, we have scoring that happens, uh, we have scoring windows every month of the year. And the submissions come in and they're scored and the data is released right back to the program every month, month after month at the rubric level. So they have data. It's not like they're waiting for a year and it's really two years late, the data coming in. I agree with you, that kind of statewide data is not awesome. It's not very illuminative because now you're two years in advance of that data, right? But this data is coming in um, just, you know, every month, just so you know about that. But uh, I, uh, data driving decision making is, right, what we're all about. That's even what we call the second cycle assessment for, you know, <laughs> doing just that. So at that level with our teachers who are doing that, we're trying to do that with faculty as well. So just wanted to let you know, but please ask your. Okay. Uh a few months, I don't know, maybe it was a year ago or more, there was the, stat, the study that was done between the different performance assessments. The comparability study? Yes, yeah, and actually my sister was on that. 
And she talked glowingly about fast. And my question for you is, given that it is so hard, and a lot of the CSUs that I'm more closely aligned with looked at it and decided not to do it, what was the impetus for Fresno to do that? And could you tell us about that? So I can't speak as much to the impetus to create fast because I wasn't around. That was, you know, early 2000s. I, I mean, just in the reading that I've done and the conversations I've had, I think it was really about the localized control. I can tell you one of the driving forces around keeping it and trying to do this work, it's the students. It, it's really about creating an assessment that is accessible for our students. So many of our students have um, really significant financial needs. And to know that we are able to provide this assessment for them at no cost, that really motivates us. Um, I think we also, I think there is also the belief that, um, you know, we can learn from this and we, we see the value of it. We see, um, though, as I shared, I don't know that we always do as much as we'd like around um, analysis of the scores and really digging into what's there. I think we all see the potential and um, want to get to that work. But as all of you involved in teacher ed know, there's just so much to do. So. Thank you. Commissioner Francois and then Commissioner um, Grenershire. I pass. Okay. I've been quiet because I haven't been wanting to repeat um, much of what's been said around this table. Um, let me add my gratitude to Amy and her team and all the folks that have presented. And in regards to FAST, there's a great article in CCTE Journal that I'll look up and I'll send the link around. It talks about the origins and, and why the faculty and the dean at the time and the associate dean put this together. I, I did want to come back to a, a thread that I keep hearing about implementation. We, we heard about the historical context. We heard about um, how hard it is for IHEs to do this work. I know we don't have a role in in supporting IHEs, but maybe we do. Maybe we do in terms of helping with professional learning communities around this. There are such there's such a great resource around this table and the colleagues that have come in. I just don't want to lose the need that I heard from many of the speakers about how do we implement performance assessments with fidelity that lead to increased um, performance by our teachers with or our candidates with a focus on those teachers of color. I, I don't want to lose that and I want to ask, if I may, the staff to help us think through and help the field think through. In the old days we used to have convenings and bring people together and maybe as we look forward in the next couple years we can think about how we do that again. Yes, yeah, so um, that the whole concept of bringing people together to share their work, we've tried to keep that alive through the Cal TPA work. For the last three years, we've had a statewide implementation conference. Prior to the pandemic, we brought everyone together. We did it in the north, we did it in the south, uh, and we did it uh, both for Cal APA and Cal TPA. So we ran a whole series of conferences that year that really wiped us out. The following year, <laughs> uh, the pandemic came along and we uh, decided to combine because we felt that the Cal APA and administrators needed to know as much about teaching and learning as, and vice versa, like why work in silos. So we brought everyone together and had an implementation conference. Uh, and then during the pandemic, uh, we thought about not doing it, but then we thought, no, you know, a lot, of, a lot of learning has been going on. We had to watch everyone transition, all of teacher prep into online spaces and how to work with children and students online. So we brought then everyone together online and um, at that, and that was a year back, and we even invited the education specialist community in because they were just starting to come. So we had gen ed, we had administrator prep programs and ed specialist programs. And this year we're doing it again in September. 
it, it will again be online because we found out that a lot of pe more people could attend if they didn't have to travel, although it's so nice to be together. Uh, maybe in a year we'll be back together. So we have been trying to do that. We have also been doing, um, we moved our uh, program coordinator work to four times a year to make sure that our program coordinators, using the performance assessments, um, the commission's performance assessments, had the opportunity to hear about the data that we were looking at quarterly across the year so they knew at the rubric level what they might be providing more supports about. Uh, we also instituted online webinars that we now call Digging Deeper, and we have faculty come and talk to other faculty. These are happening now four or five times a year, and everything is archived on our YouTube channel. Uh, we have also built program guides to help programs really think deeply about the underlying theory of action. We'll be showing you one of those in a bit. And then um, we even instituted during the pandemic direct office hours for candidates. And we have been talking directly to the Cal TBA candidates and directly to the Cal APA candidates that want to come and talk to us to get support in a time when we didn't think they could get support. And we have been offering program office hours as well. This is every single week. You can talk to us live. And in addition to that, we knew the induction community that welcomed all of those candidates that left their preliminary programs, whether they were teachers or leaders, to come into induction experiences. We opened up office hours for those program staff as well. So we've, we've tried to build that, and we would love to continue to build those communities of learners, um, bringing in the other assessments as well into these, into these kinds of ways. Um, but it is complex work. It is time-consuming work. We have lots of faculty that come and join us. Now we're actually having candidates that we talk to. So we're trying. We'd love to do more. If there's more we can do, we would be happy to do it. Amy, you know how much I appreciate you and your staff and all the work that you are you continue to do in this area. I, th I think Cap said it really well that that California is so progressive in this area, and we can continue to lead the way. And I want to encourage us to do that, and to continue to focus on those students of color that that yes. some, not all, some are being left behind. So what are we doing intentionally? In these in these workshops to help faculty think more deeply about that, we know what to do. How do we help them to do it? Yeah, that is a really Thank good you. point. The other thing I'll just I forgot to mention is that we, around this whole notion that we do deeply believe that when you come and sit through and look at submission after submission, video after video, look at that writing from teachers and their lesson plans, and look at the equity work that uh, administrators aspiring administrators are putting forward is that that's the deep learning and really having to map the evidence to the rubric language. So we do what we call faculty trainings and we got these underway again the year right before the pandemic and our fifth one that we were offering uh, ended up being postponed because the pandemic hit that week and so we couldn't have people together. Um, but we're going to be reinstituting those as well this fall. Um, and we can particularly then draw out so what supports can we put in place to help our candidates across the full range of diversity? How do we welcome them in? What are we doing in particular? Uh, what are things we might do? So absolutely, 100% um, agree that we need to really focus in on that. Thank you. OK. <clears throat> I, I would just add to that, and lifting up the best practice and examples of the programs that have provided the significant and necessary support to, um, to, to candidates of color and others. Uh, Commissioner Gross. Thank you. I, I know we, um, I'm looking at the clock too, um, but I, I just, um, I've been reflecting on what you said, Commissioner Francois, about, about high, the high stakes testing component. I'm reflecting about Fresno making a choice to embed and Dr. Critch talking about embedding the TPA within our curriculum. And our, our comments that have been about the burden that students carry in passing this exam. And thinking about program accountability. And, um, you know, we design the systems to get the results that we produce. And so how might we provide some incentives, supports, for programs to embed the TPA into their program to, to include that cost into the program 
um, you know, when we think about in the K through 12 space, um, we don't ask our students to go do the CASP on a Saturday. They wouldn't go, right? Um, and when we thought about equity and who is taking AP exams and the SAT uh, and realized that our students of color were not and our students of poverty were not, we did it at school and we paid for it. And so I think I would really like to see that a part of the conversation of how do we support IHEs in doing that um, because um, it's a shared burden. It should be a shared burden. Um, you know, I'm a special education teacher and there are things that, that I have to do for compliance, right? And, and it's the law and it's state law and it's federal law. Um, and I can choose to like see that as a burden and not do it, right? And, and not succeed. Or I can say, oh my gosh, we have all these smart people around this table. We have Dr. Sales who's saying, you could use this as a lever for anti-bias, anti-racist teaching. We could do that, but, but we have to share that burden of responsibility. And if our institutions are saying our students are burdened and this isn't fair, then, then I would kindly ask as, a, as an educator who has gone through our public institutions and now teaches at a, a private IHE, that we gotta do some own self-reflection, right? That we ask our teachers to do when our students don't do well on the CASP, when our students don't pass AP exams. Um, and so uh, that's kind of my impassioned plea here that that we gotta share some of this burden. Um, it's not a CTC burden, it's not a student burden, it's, right, it's gotta be shared um, so that it can be a learning opportunity and a growth moment. Um, and because we do want our, our teachers to plan, do, study, act. Um, so it concerns me when I'm hearing commenters saying it's not authentic. Um, so uh, I'm just wondering how we do that. Like, how do we bring people to the table? How do we incentivize that really complicated work of going through your program and redesigning and, and working with folks who don't want to do it? Right? <laughs> like, I, we all, change is really hard, and I'm just not going to do it. And what are you going to do about it? <laughs> right? Where is that accountability? Um, so I would just really love to explore that. How do we do that? How do we use this assessment as a lever um, and not burden students and maybe share that accountability? So. Thank you. I think that um, almost was a great closing comment. <laughs> Unless there's others who uh, want to try to one up Commissioner Gross here. All right. So um, deep gratitude to our speakers, our panelists, um, Amy and, and Mary for, um, the sta for staffing this and for bringing so many different perspectives. And so we're gonna go ahead and close this item. It was information item only, so no action. Um, but you'll see that we have a couple other things to do. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna just